And now, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Irene Moore Davis. Irene Moore Davis is a Windsor, Ontario-based educator, writer, historian, activist, and podcaster. She frequently speaks about diversity, inclusion, equity, and African-Canadian history. She fulfills a variety of community roles, including president of the Essex County Black Historical Research Society, co-chair of Black Women of Forward Action, co-host of All Right in the Sin City podcast, and program chair at BookFest Windsor. Irene was co-executive producer of the award-winning short documentary, The North Was Our Canaan. Her new documentary project is entitled Across the River to Freedom, and it's going to be released in 2022. A seventh generation African Canadian whose ancestral families include the Shads, Irene is an administrator at St. Clair College, where she also teaches English, underground railroad history, and Black cultural studies. We are so fortunate that Irene will be moderating our panel this morning. Thank you so much, Irene. Well, thank you for that warm welcome and welcome everybody. Thrilled to be here today to help facilitate this important discussion on activating archives and anniversaries. Let me introduce our panelists. Lopez D. Matthews Jr. is the digital production librarian at Howard University Libraries and the Moorland Springarn Research Center. He is a commissioner on the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture and a member of the board of directors of the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland, African American History and Culture in Baltimore. He has published several articles and is the author of Howard University in the World Wars, Men and Women Serving the Nation. In 2020, he became a senior advisor to the U.S. Truth, Healing, and Transformation Leadership Group. Welcome, Lopez D. Matthews, Jr. Melissa J. Nelson is a second-generation Jamaican-Canadian from Toronto, Ontario. Melissa currently works as the research assistant in equity and diversity for McGill University School of Information Studies. Prior to this, she held archival positions and placements at George Brown College Archives, the Presbyterian Church in Canada Archives, the Law Society of Ontario Archives, and Clara Thomas Archives and Special Collections at York University. Melissa conducts research and produces content on history and archive-related topics for her website, melissajnelson.com. Welcome, Melissa J. Nelson. I'd also like to introduce Curtis Small. Curtis Small is the coordinator of public services for special collections at University of Delaware, where he coordinates the reference, instruction, and exhibition programs. Curtis' research interests include the history of the African-American book, the history of the colored conventions movement, and Caribbean francophone literature. Welcome, Curtis Small. And Sean Smith is a senior archivist in the Collections Development and Management Unit at the Archives of Ontario, located in Toronto. He previously held positions at the Clara Thomas Archives at York University and Library and Archives Canada. In total, he has been preserving and sharing history for over 20 years. During the pandemic, he has been focused on issues related to archives and community engagement developing a glam wiki presence for the Archives of Ontario and digital records. Welcome, Sean Smith, and thank you to all of our panelists for being here today. So let's begin with some questions. I want to begin with the question, how has the legacy of Marianne Shad Carey impacted your professional work? I'd like to, to throw that first to Sean, if I may. How has sure. the legacy of Marianne Shad Carey impacted your professional work? Sure. Um, I think the most obvious uh, thing to point out is uh, I'm here amongst a group of international scholars uh, talking about uh, what archives and, uh, can do to activate the legacy of Marianne Shad Carey. Um, listening to the speakers yesterday and understanding sort of uh, the migration patterns of Marianne Shad Carey, she, she went to so many different places. Uh, to, to meet people and to talk about issues. And that's exactly what we're doing today, uh, which is, uh, I think, a great testament to sort of her, her legacy. Um, from my 
professional point of view and from the point of view of the Archives of Ontario, this past 18 months, two years has really uh, been a transformational period for the archives. Um, it's been a period where we've been sort of challenging our own paradigms to sort of start thinking more in terms of how we can be in service to communities, uh, how we can really be more uh, humble and aware of the material that we, we house and that we are supporting um, and really thinking through how we can be more forward with it and reaching out to, to the people who really sort of benefit from having access to that. Um, so I think we started really looking at how we could sort of um, make uh, records related to black histories more public using our Glam Wiki uh, initiative, but uh, that's also brought us in, t in contact with the, the Transcribe Shad um, project out of, uh, out of Penn State University. Um, it's led to us sort of looking back at sort of uh, past relationships that the archives have had and seeing how we can be, uh, uh, how we can support sort of the preservation of those materials in a more meaningful way. And using the apparatuses that we now have uh, access to, digitization, for example, to sort of really take that material and get it out in front of the public. Um, and, and that has been exactly uh, what Marianne Shad Carey has afforded us, is just the opportunity to sort of work with that material uh, hopefully, uh, once once we're we're able to be back in our building to to digitize it and to share it with a, an international audience, and to really have conversations that are meaningful in, in ways that we can uh, not only get people to understand more about what we do at the Archives of Ontario and what our interests are, but but mostly just how we can be of service uh, to communities uh, who really need the materials to sort of uh, tell their own stories. Thank you. I'm going to throw the same question to Melissa J. Nelson. How has the legacy of Marianne Shad Carey impacted your professional work? Yeah, so I would say for me, um, growing up in Canada and realizing how buried Canadian history, Black Canadian history is, um, and learning about Marianne Shad Carey and how significant she was, how uh, significant Black political organizing was, how significant black figures were and how important it is that this is visible um, that this is included in the education system um, so in my in my work I um, I sent through black scholars I have a, a workshop that is reoccurring is coming up again um, on uh, anti-black uh, records and archives and how scholars do look for those records black scholars look for those records and it's very important for their work and so i center black scholars and uh and their needs to be able to locate records and the importance of visibility of these records and um just speak to a bit of their experiences in archives and how important it is for black scholars to be able to do uh the work to bring visibility to black canadian history and our experiences in canada okay and lopez d matthews jr same question um, I think in terms of looking at the way we uh, manage our collections at Moreland, having a Marianne Chad Carey collection really adds to what Dorothy Porter Wesley was seeking to create when she built the archive, creating this mosaic of the Black experience. She really wanted to build an archive that spoke to every aspect of the Black experience. And so having collections related to Black women, Black men, women of achievement, but then also regular African-Americans. So I think that having someone like her, who is of course a Howard graduate, someone who accomplished so much, someone who fought for black rights, I think that it just helps us tell the story of black people in totality, if that makes sense, you know, cause that's what the goal was. The more or less being our research center, came out of Kelly Miller's mind, and he wanted it to be a space where Black people were at the forefront of preserving and promoting the study of Black history. He was working with uh, Carter G. Woodson, who founded the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, and that was sort of their focus. And so having her collection amongst the other collections sort of adds to the goal of telling a complete story of the Black experience. So why are archives and anniversaries specifically important for work, the work that you do, Melissa? Why, by that you mean this uh, conference? Why are archives and anniversaries in general important for the work that you do? Well, archives are really uh, significant for uh, 
being able to determine what we remember and what we forget. And that has had a tremendous impact on what we remember collectively about Black people and what Black people are even allowed to access um, in terms of records and, and scholarship to understand our experiences in Canada, to understand uh, the impact of um, the Canadian government on Black people and to help us better understand ourselves. Um, so that's why I'm very interested in uh, being in the archive field because I see uh, the impact, the larger impact that it has and the, the impact it has on Black communities. Okay, thank you. Lopez, same question. Um, I think it's so important. I think the dates are important because that brings people's attention to what's in the collection. You know, that's what brings the wider attention. And so you get the numbers that then tell your administration, support me because people want to use my material. So that's why the dates are really important. Um, in terms of the archives, though, I think they're really important just because they tell some sometimes they tell the true story and sometimes they tell the story that people want to create because you know sometimes the documents while they're documents they aren't really what happened but they're what was recorded and so you know i think that they really they tell a story and i love to tell my student workers when they first start kind of like a trigger warning that these are the unencumbered stories of people's lives most of them they didn't expect someone would be reading these letters 30, 40 years later. And so these are their unencumbered thoughts. So you have to keep that in mind. And that's what I love about archives and why I love working with archives is that you're reading something that's probably someone's truest self because it wasn't their public face, you know, like me, I'm sitting here with my tie on, my shirt and everything, but the real me, you know, has on a t-shirt and I'm just laying around but and so that's why I love archives and that's what I think is the importance of archives because it strips away the veneer of your public face and lets you see for the most part who someone truly is and that's what I love about it. That is fascinating this idea of sort of the shoes off version of these historical figures. <laughs> I'm sure that your students must really relate to that. Let me tell you they found a letter in a very prominent figures collection that he wrote to his wife and he was talking about his son going off to college and he's saying oh you know we're here I wrote this off I mean I'm, I dropped him off we did this we did that and then he added a PS that was very NSFW <laughs> and the student came and said oh my god look what he wrote and I said well you just gotta remember this is a private letter to his wife so you know you'll see things like that you know just like today people do the texting and so it's just like that so <laughs> I, I, that's why I just love it. I love it. Tremendous. Sean, why are archives and anniversaries important for the work that you do? Well, I think anniversaries provide an opportunity for archives to be relevant and to be part of a conversation and to contribute to celebrations, uh, how, whatever they might be or how, however those may look. Um, I think for the most part, you know, Collections can just dwindle in an archives and get dusty and, and adhere to every stereotype that there is of, of an archives. But anniversaries, if, if archivists are self-aware and are uh, knowledgeable of their collection, uh, do provide an opportunity for us to make sure that stuff gets out and gets into the hands of people who are doing the commemorating and, and to start thinking about those things. So anniversaries are a point of reflection, uh, both for the value of archives as well as the value of the organizations or individuals who, who, who are being commemorated or remembered during those uh, significant periods. Um, but they're also an important uh, um, opportunity for engagement, um, for renewing relationships with donors who uh, we may not have spoken to for, for 20 years. Um, if we are, as we are at the Archives of Ontario, trying to think uh, more concretely in terms of, of the documentation that we haven't been paying attention to, it's an opportunity for us also to reach out, understanding that there's an anniversary coming up and sort of saying, here is the point in your history where you're thinking about your past. What are you going to do about preserving it? Can we support you in doing that? Um, and that doesn't mean that, that we have to be the custodians of anybody's records, but uh, if there's anything that we can provide during those moments to sort of uh, support memory work within communities, uh, then that's something that, uh, that that's an opportunity for us to, to participate in or to, to, uh, to move towards. 
You've touched on something really important in that answer, which is individuals and families' um, reticence uh, to hand over um, custodianship of their precious records. What are the ways in which you can overcome or find that you have been overcoming those um, expressions of reluctance? Uh, well, sort of the, uh, the phrase I've been using is just uh, us moving forward with active humility. Uh, the assumption not moving, we're a large institution. We're the second largest archives in Canada. We're the provincial archives, which is the equivalent of a state archives in, in the US. Um, we have a history of 100 years of, of collecting, which has left out a lot of communities uh, and, and raises a lot of questions about what we've been up to. Um, so uh, for us, I think it's giving over as much of our power as possible to community decisions. So uh, not insisting or not assuming that the end result of any of, uh, any of these conversations is for us to acquire records, but it's to build relationships over time. Um, it's for us to sort of start interacting with um, projects that are happening, granted projects, other types of projects, and just seeing how we can fit in. Can we support them by giving over our records? So for example, with the, the Glam Wiki project, uh, it's a shift, it's a paradigm shift because we're giving up control over our images as best as we can, high res images so that they can, can be used automatically and immediately in, in, uh, in community projects. Um, so it's just moving away from the idea of custodianship as the end result of any conversation and moving towards one of relationship um, and not having expectations uh, in terms of outcomes, but just really moving with the flow of those conversations and seeing where they go. Um, I don't think that's something that uh, uh, archivists are comfortable with necessarily, um, but it's certainly something that we have to uh, become more attuned to if we want to remain relevant in the present and in the future. Melissa or Lopez, do you have any comments to add to, to that component of the conversation? You know, how archivists can encourage communities and individuals to come forward and, and share what they have or participate um, in partnerships of this kind? Well, I think that with, uh, with us, we just kind of emphasize the fact that, you know, we're not taking it from you. We're just preserving it to make it available. And that, you know, it's not, you know, that we're going to be custodians of the records, you know, that that's what our goal is. Our goal isn't to make money from it. Our goal isn't to, strip you of your copyright our goal isn't to you know take it from you our goal is just to be cus proper custodians of this history and this legacy and make them understand that that is our purpose and that is our goal and that has been fairly helpful because you know sometimes people feel like oh you're coming to take it from me and so they feel a loss of ownership and you know we just kind of make sure that they understand that no it's not a loss of ownership you're just ensuring that it's preserved in perpetuity and that's our goal and that's really all our purpose is so that's kind of what we emphasize mm -hmm. melissa you're nodding yeah um i haven't had this experience of having to build relationships with communities for an archival institution but i hear how they're both speaking to the importance of trying to understand the community that you want to work with and building relationships with them and trying to dispel any bias that they might have because black communities do typically perceive archives a certain way and they, there is fear there, there is mistrust there. So the approach that they're both uh, speaking to, it sounds like it's very important and impactful in the relationship that they're trying to build. Well, this is really an important um, piece as we come up on Marianne Chad Carey's 200th anniversary in 2023, and we certainly want to ensure that archives and that anniversary are really showcased and, and help to establish the importance of this event and this woman and her work and her networks for the for both countries and, and for memory and for possibilities. Moving on to the next question, I'm wondering um, how can your institution or field continue to advance work that foregrounds Black women's political activism? And what changes would you like to see in this area? Melissa? Uh, for me, that brings to mind how um, traditional practices are not, you know, they're not created with uh, Black records in mind. And so Black 
archivists and black family workers who are working with black records, working with records that speak to black political activism, um, they will likely have to adopt a, a methodology that is outside of that. And I have uh, been part of conversations about to potential creation of a black archival studies. Um, and I know University of Toronto is looking to hire an assistant professor for uh, black studies and archives. So I think what would really be significant in, in this field is if that meth the methodologies that come from black archivists and memory workers is uh, recognized in the field and recognized in library and information studies uh, programs and something that can be adopted in archival institutions as well to support that work. Okay, very good. And um, Sean, how does your institution or field continue to advance work that foregrounds Black women's political activism specifically, and what changes would you like to see in that area? Yeah, so I think there's some things that, that, that are changing that I think are, are important to become a part of the profession as a whole to start thinking about. And that's, that's kind of like, uh, for us to be more interested and involved in thinking about uh, the gaps in our holdings, um, to start identifying sort of uh, records that that may be out there, out there, or individuals out there who have been uh, important to uh, communities, Black communities here in Ontario, uh, especially women, um, and really reaching out to them and sort of uh, engaging in those conversations that sort that sort of indicate that. Your historic records are important, and, and we want to support uh, the preservation of them, whether that's uh, through uh, donating them to the Archives of Ontario or by placing them somewhere where, where uh, they, they might be used. But I think, and I'm a, I'm a white settler, and I'm totally biased, and, and I have a, a certain position of privilege when, when I speak about this, but my understanding from having uh, worked with a number of communities is that archives are not something that people think about uh, as, as their right or or something that, uh, I mean, our collections are predominantly white settlers, long established Ontario families um, who have had time, who have had security, who have had the opportunities to sort of really uh, think about their legacies and to build a, a basement's worth of records and then donate them to the archives. But I think for us, it's important to be involved in organizations that are actually doing stuff here and now um, and just planting the seed that the, 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 you know, the activities that are going on on the ground need to be thought about long term. Um, and, and as I said, whether that's by considering a donation at some point to the Archives of Ontario or to us, just getting into that, to that conversation early enough that uh, records of, for future generations to look back on will provide evidence of the important work that's, be, that's being done in, in the here and now. Okay, and Lopez, same question. I think that for us, um, one of the things I want us to remember is kind of what our mission has been in that, you know, we have been tasked with preserving the Black experience and understand that, you know, if you look at our uh, finding aids, they all say local practice on them. Because, and I always point back to Dorothy Porter Wesley, because when she saw that Black people and Black culture wasn't uh, identified in like the Library of Congress subject headings, she created her own subject headings that better reflected the Black experience. And so what mm -hmm. I think that we need to do is to remember that and not sort of move towards, I know there's a standardization happening in the archival world, but remember that, you know, we're an archive that is always focused on recognizing the culture that we're trying to preserve and trying to represent. And so we have to remember that while standardization is okay, and while there is a place for it, we also have to recommend, we also have to understand that we have to remember the culture and remember that the culture isn't standard. And so you have to leave space for like this organization has a specific language that if you're not a part of that organization, you really won't understand it. And so we have to remember that you have to keep in mind the culture of the people that you're working with and use your description and use your keywords and use these things toward the organization and toward the people. 
And so not to get so caught up in the standardization of it and in that you forget what you're trying to represent and what you're trying to preserve. So I hope that that is something that people who are preserving these records remember and that that's what stays in the future. Because I see a lot of reparative work happening and is the reparative work erasing the culture, you know? So that's, a, but and it's a fine line in that, you know? Mm -hmm. Can I just jump jump back in? Please. Yeah, well, one other thing too, sorry, I should have mentioned it when I hadn't, when it was my time. Uh, so I, I do apologize for that. But uh, I think another thing too, and it's really important is, is archives need to also just be aware that when uh, records of diverse communities are being donated to, uh, you know, a state archives or a provincial archives. That there's a certain privilege. Uh, there's a certain sort of. We need to be understanding that um, that's not, not always going to be an easy thing to do. And so, as archives and, and archivists, we really need to be clear about the fact that we understand that and and commit to working with that material equally to any other collection that we have in our holdings. And so I think what that really means is speaking with the donors, speaking with the communities and understanding the wishes for that material. And then taking sort of the, the uh, resources that we have at our disposal to do the most possible to, to make sure that material is, is made accessible, uh, that it's widely dispersed if, if that's possible. Um, and then it's shared amongst a number of research communities so that it doesn't become material that just goes into the back of the vault, but it's material that gets showcased at the front of our website and that uh, we are doing our, our, our best and we're building trust by making sure that we're going to follow through with our commitments to making sure that this material um, is, is uh, treated and dispersed and is, is widely accessible as is possible. And that is a really important distinction that you've just made. I mean, I know that many of us know that last year, lots of archives, lots of libraries, lots of uh, collections suddenly threw to the front for performative purposes, whatever um, African descendant community stuff they had and kind of tried to shine a light on it just to say, okay, we're good, we, we did this. But you're talking about a much more long-term and ongoing relationship building practice, right? So what is the role of community partnerships in this important work? And are there ways in which the spirit of Marianne Shad Carey and Black organizing are impacting your practice? I'm going to throw this one to Sean. All right, I'll just keep going. Um, community partnerships are extremely important. Um, I think more important than they ever have been in, in, in the past. I think uh, practice, uh, archival practice in the past has always been about us receiving donation offers, um, making considerations about whether we should be acquiring the material or not, and then going forward from, from that point forward. As I said, in many cases, in many, in many cases, the stuff gets put in the back of the vault and never comes out again. Uh, but I think community partnerships need to be in the forefront for helping us to understand how we're perceived, what we're doing right, what we're not doing right, um, whether we're relevant, um, whether we need to shift our practices to be more accommodating to uh, um, a multiplicity of, of, of communities. Um, do people understand what it means when we describe stuff or do we need to be more, uh, uh, we need to rethink that as well so that we're speaking in language that uh, that, that more, more people can understand and that the, the records that we hold and we preserve are, are surfaceable um, and discoverable in our descriptive systems, which aren't always obvious. Um, we don't understand communities the way that community members do. Um, we have, uh, you know, certain blinders, we have uh, certain perspectives, and there's things that we do well. Um, but for us to really sort of be relevant and to sort of uh, reach out and to see how we can be of service to those communities, we really need to make uh, inroads into those communities and listen uh, to uh, uh, what community members say. Um, so I recently had a conversation uh, um, with someone who's working on the on. Um, mapping Ontario, Ontario's Black Archives project. And, and we talked about, you know, ways that we could be sort of working together. And, you know, she wanted to understand what our acquisition interests were and our acquisition mandates. And, and I think the perspective that we're trying to get across is that our acquisition interests are your acquisition interests. We'll listen to you uh, because you know the material better than we do. And if in your mapping of Ontario's Black Archives, you're surfacing collections that need a home and they, they make sense to come to the Archives of Ontario, 
then then that's something that we want to be a part of. But uh, it, it's not for us to determine that that we know everything. And so community partnerships, relationships with communities is uh, what's going to make for, uh, you know, a meaningful Archives of Ontario uh, in the future. Okay, thank you. Lopez, I'm throwing the same question to you. What is the role of community partnerships in this important work? And are there any ways in which the spirit of Marianne Shad Carey and Black organizing impact your practice? Um, I think it's extremely important because all of this work is community work. You're preserving community stories. And so you have you almost have to partner with the community to get the work done, to get to tell the stories correctly, to Make sure you're preserving the prop the material properly. You know, we uh we always encourage uh the organizations that we work with, particularly the people we work with, to come in and work with us as we process the material. I'm like, hey, you know it better than we do. So you'll make sure that we do it properly. We'll do it correctly. So if you want to come in, look at it. If something's incorrect, thank you. We'll fix it, you know. So we really encourage, you know, them to remain in contact and to work with us in the preservation of their material, everyone, even if someone is, if they're alive and if they're there to do it, you know, work with us to make sure that it's preserved properly, that it's described properly, that, you know, we're doing it the right way, you know? And so that's, and I think that's really the benefit of community partnerships that you're working with the people who you're preserving their history so that you do it in a correct and respectful way. And then also that you get the work done, you know. They uh, sometimes very helpful with getting the funding to get the material processed, you know, or they fund it themselves. Hey, we want to make sure this is available. So we'll pay for it to be processed, you know. And you say, oh, thanks. That helps. You know, the digitization is the new thing now. Oh, how can we get this digitized? And it's like, okay, well, here's the process to move toward digitization. So if you want to support that, come help support it. And so I think that there's just a multitude of ways that remaining connected to the communities that have donated their records and may just maintaining active relationships can benefit the archives and the community. But also, and I didn't want to miss this because it almost floated out of my head, but also that you help them preserve the records that they are not interested in letting go just yet. If you're going to maintain records, okay, here's how you can best maintain the records that you're not interested in giving away just yet and not even that you have to give it to us but that is preserved so that it can be preserved in perpetuity not being proprietary oh when you have to give it to us but that okay we're going to make sure that you're also maintaining what you hold as well mm -hmm. and melissa what is the role of community partnerships in your work and are there ways in which the spirit of marianne shad carey and black organizing impact your practice um, so I would say in my work currently, I'm, I've been doing workshops um, and I would be doing other events to work with uh, Black professionals that want to create their own archives. Um, but I would say to speak to what both Sean and Lopez said, they really emphasize the importance of communities being involved in the decision making <clears throat> and that, that it's really important for them to be involved in the decision making um, for how records from their communities are processed, how it's made accessible. Um, and I think that's that's very important for communities to be involved in that way. Very good. And as I continue with my questions, I just want to reiterate to all of our guests today that you have the opportunity to post your questions in the chat. We will have a Q&A that starts shortly and we'll look forward to having your questions answered too. So my next question is, what is at stake for your institution or field when it comes to centering Black political organizing materials and topics? Sean? Uh, I think it's an enormous amount of credibility. Uh, we, we've been, um, as I said, over the last 18 months or so, we've been really trying to sort of shift the paradigm, both of the way that we operate outwardly and the way people perceive us. Um, I, I think it's incredibly important for us to uh, follow up on our commitments, um, and that includes with uh, the Marianne Shad Carey material. Uh, that's following through to the 200th anniversary, uh, following through on our commitments to to digitize the, the collection in its entirety, to share it widely, 
to work with other communities to give that material over to to local communities here in Ontario and, and communities across the border. Um, you know, I think we, we've done some some pretty good work and we've 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 started to develop some some great converse, conversations and some good relationships. But uh, if we stop at any point in time or if we we stumble or we, we don't follow through on our commitments and there's a huge loss of credibility there. Um, our goal is to be the archives of all of Ontario, uh, to be able to sort of uh, incorporate the stories of, of all the people of Ontario and all the stories that have made up uh, the history of Ontario. Um, and so if we wanna do that, uh, we need to follow through, we need to be present, we need to keep showing up. Um, and if we don't, people will notice. So I, I think we, we, we need to, to make sure that uh, we are um, present in many conversations and that we are following through on anything we committed to. Thank you. And Lopez, what is at stake for your institution or field when it comes to centering Black political organizing materials and topics? Uh, I think it's the same as what John said, you know, goes to credibility. You know, we've always sort of been an archive that has centered the mosaic of the Black experience, and that is an integral part of it. And so if we're not documenting, if we're not preserving, and if we're not telling that part of the story, then we're really not telling the totality of the Black experience. And so it's basically integral to the work that we do, that we maintain and preserve and make available these histories and these stories, you know, it's because it is so integral to the, the Black experience that it's almost like it would be impossible to tell a true story without that piece. Melissa, your thoughts? Just to add what Lopez said, if, you know, the Black, uh, Black records and the history of Black political organizing isn't acknowledged and centered, that does add to the larger erasure of our history in Canada and America um, that adds to um, the ignorance that is widespread in our country. So I think that is a huge issue as well. It's really important for archival institutions to center Black records and the experiences of Black people um, for, for scholarship, for education, for us to um, actually understand Black people in this country, our experiences in, in this country and in America. Um, so that's what, that's what I would say. Thank you. So what are the challenges that your institution or field faces when trying to advance conversations and initiatives around Black women's political activism, organizing, and institution building? What are the specific challenges that are faced in, in that endeavor? Melissa. I'm not sure if I've been in the field long enough to to truly speak to this question. Okay. Um, could you come back to me after? Maybe I can I add to what they say. <laughs> I certainly can. I'm going to go to the man with 20 years of experience, so that's mm -hmm. Sean. <laughs> so, what are the challenges that your institution or field faces, Sean, when trying to advance conversations and initiatives around Black women's political activism, organizing, and institution building? Well, the pandemic is certainly a significant challenge. It's hard to follow through on, on relationship building when you can't see people face to face um, other than on a screen. But I think we're all dealing with that. Um, I think it, it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. And that's just the, the getting to know um, the field a little bit more. I mean, uh, just just getting to understand the nuances of, of, of black activism, of who is involved, who, who are the players, uh, what, are the, what, the, what the interests are. And that, as, a, as I've said before, is, is just about not shying away from potentially difficult conversations, but reaching out to people and just seeing if there's a way that we can get to understand uh, how, how we can be uh, supporting uh, communities. Um, so in Toronto, we have... Um, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, Canada and the Wild Seed Centre, which is an artist-run centre uh, here in Toronto for, for um, Black act, arts and activism, they were recently granted uh, funding to build an archive. So we'll be, I'll be meeting with them on Monday. Um, and again, it's the no expectations, no, no uh, preconceived notions. It's just trying to figure out what their interest is in, in building an archives, 
what can we share? How, we, how can we support that in terms of um, any knowledge or expertise we, we may have? Is any of it useful? We're, we're willing to share that. Is there a way that we can be working together in sort of a, a collaborative acquisition sort of uh, way? Uh, can we can we sort of uh, uh, work with the, with the organization to sort of identify those groups of records that that might be provincially significant and which they might feel would be better better placed at the Archives of Ontario? So these are these are just conversations and things that we'll figure out. Again, supporting um, projects that are already underway um, and just seeing how we can be a part of that. Um, so they're all challenges, of course, um, time, resources, understanding, all that stuff. But I think of them more as opportunities to, to get to, to, to know something that I didn't before and just to become better humans. Lopez, what are the challenges that your institution or field faces when trying to advance conversations and initiatives around Black women's political activism, organizing, and institution building? I think probably the biggest challenge would be maintaining that focus. There's a lot of attention to Black history now, and it's very specific on specific topics, specific organizations, specific stories. So much is placed, you know, so much focus, particularly because of what has happened over the last year with Black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. the protests and the focus on anti-racism. And so there are a lot of competing interests. And so balancing what stories gets told in the capacity that you have to tell them is probably the biggest challenge, you know, ensuring that in the list of everyone's interests, it doesn't get lost in the shuffle. You know, that's probably the biggest, uh, I would say, challenge in the field right now. Because there's a lot of interest in telling certain stories and who's funding certain projects, what is getting the most attention. And sometimes the funding becomes the driver of what gets done. And so then that becomes, okay, well, is that kind of cutting off certain stories because those with the funding want to tell this story? And then it pushes back those other stories that are equally as important, but they don't have the big funders behind them to tell those stories. And so that's something that, you know, is a challenge and it's something that's kind of been in the back of my mind, particularly watching what has happened over the last 18 months. And so while wow, there's a lot of people coming into the Black history, Black storytelling space and they're sometimes driving the story as opposed to those who've kind of always been there telling the story. And so what is the effect of that? And so I think that is probably the biggest challenge that I see right now. Okay, focus. just a reminder, story focus, absolutely. And that equitable distribution of focus, right? Yes. yes. It's true, it's true. Sometimes the dollars speak um, or, or, or cause us to speak in certain ways and to shine our lights on certain things. Melissa, your opportunity to add anything to these comments? I just wanted to say I really uh, appreciated Lopez's comment. Um, and just to add that, uh, I, I believe he's referring to how some, some records have been uh, tokenized house, black stories have, are, are being amplified perhaps in a performative way in some instances, right? And so, yes, this is something that needs to be ongoing. It's not just uh, something that people should be hopping on as a trend now because this is a current conversation. This is something that, you know, black history matters. It's a part of Canadian history. It's part of American history and it shouldn't be tokenized. It should be meaningfully recognized just like white history. Very good. Thank you. So we're going to go to the audience Q&A now, and there are some great questions that have popped up in the chat. Um, Lauren, do you want to get started? I know there was something that Kristen posted quite a while ago. So if you want to scroll up to that, sorry, Kristen, I, I'd love to uh, hear these, these wonderful questions. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so Kirsten Lee, she spoke yesterday, um, presenting a paper. Um, she asks, it strikes me that many Black memory workers aren't employed as archivists, curators, etc., and are unfortunately at many institutions unlikely to ever be so. 
Do you all have any thoughts about how the profession shapes what we call the archive? Um, I can speak to this briefly. I think the first issue is that to work in an archive, to be employed as an archivist, you have to go study library information studies, which is, you know, these programs are largely so steeped in white supremacy that they are not spaces um, or programs that feel safe or, you know, created for Black people. And if Black people go into archives with an interest of preserving Black records, you're going to learn traditional theories and practices that are not created for Black records. Um, so I think for some Black people that want to be archivists, they come, they get into archival work outside of the archive field. But then that's not legitimized because they didn't get an LIS degree. So I think that is the root of the issue there is how info science has been institutionalized and that that's the only thing that's truly seen as legitimate for archival uh, institutions to hire black memory workers. And I guess I'll just to kind of piggyback off that, I will say that the field itself has not always been welcoming to black memory workers. It has been a pretty, uh, I don't want to say, I don't want, it can be debilitating to some people. I know that we have had, um, being who we are, we sometimes see information science students come to us for support. They're not Howard students, <laughs> but they come to us for support from other institutions because they don't get that support at their home institution. So they come to us for affirmation and come to us for support. And we do provide that. And it's unfortunate that they're not getting that support at their home institutions. But you know, that's kind of the space that we've carved in. And then you also have to remember that the field does not is not the most well funded. And so they don't pay. You know, depending on where you are, you're not being paid as well as you probably feel you should have. And so sometimes you're just priced out. You know, I just can't afford to do the work. I would love to do the work, but I just can't afford to stay there because it's not going to pay, you know, what I need to pay. And, you know, and that's just being real, you know, it, you know, you can't take a vow of poverty, you know, <laughs> just to do the work. And so, you know, that's just sometimes the reality of the field. Can I just add to that? Uh, it also just brought to mind how I think what a lot of uh, what a lot of black memory workers and you know black scholars who want to be archivists do think of as well is that most archives are dominant white institutions. So that means you will likely spend most of your career processing records that doesn't speak to what you would like to prioritize as well because of various reasons because of the, in, the, the, the way the institution functions, right? So um, in Canada, I see more Black scholars working outside of archives because that is how they can do the work that they want to do to amplify Black history. You can't really do that from a predominantly white institution. At least that's how a lot of people feel. That is currently how I feel that it, I think it's changing a bit, but it is, it is more difficult because it's an institution, um, right? So. Yeah, and I can certainly appreciate that it's a steep uphill climb to um, get to a place where the collections we have would be of interest uh, to Black archivists. I mean, if we want to attract Black archivists to our institution, for example, we have to make the work way more interesting. I feel for anybody who anybody who comes into our building on an entry level job because it's it's a lot of boring work working on uh, things that just aren't that interesting. So uh, I mean, from that perspective, I don't see why anybody would want to enter into the archives. Um, but uh, certainly, if we want to get to a place where uh, more uh, black archivists are interested in staying in the profession, we have to make sure that the work is there to sustain interest and, and that uh, that is res respectful and affords opportunities for for individuals to to work on the projects and to move into the directions that uh, that, that are important to 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 them. I also just wanted to add, sorry, that, you know, from my experience working in an archive and speaking to other people of color who worked in archives, 
the other issue is that not just that sometimes the records that you work with may not be of interest to you. They could be traumatizing to you. They could affect you psychologically, right? Um, so it, it can t it can be a lot of emotional labor to work in an archive for some for some um, black people as well. And some people, before they even get an education, they already have that fear that that will be their experience. And so I think the more things slowly start to change, the more there are um, like black professors and library and information studies uh, methodology for working with black records, archives collecting more black records that could change over time. But that is also an issue that people have a fear of what it will be like to work with the records or they have difficult experiences working with the records. That's true, it can be exhausting. You know, it, it really can be exhausting just doing this work and reading it and seeing the images and the stories and you're like, oh, goodness, it's draining. <laughs> you know, some days it can be draining, you know. All right, I'm gonna go on to the next question. Um, I'm just gonna go in order the way they've been coming in. Um, so the next one comes from, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Thaisa Wei. Um, she asked, thinking about the importance of land to Shad Carey, I wonder how archives might think about how they archive relationships to place, practice that are about the land, soil, and place. Does this shape the materials of the archive? Sorry, could you repeat that one more time? <laughs> I'll try to read it a little bit smoother too. <clears throat> Thinking about the importance of land to Shad Carey, I wonder how archives might think about how the might think about how they archive relationships to place um, practices that are about land, soil, and place. Does this shape the materials of the archive? Yeah, so I think thinking uh, specifically in terms of Marianne Shad Carey. Uh, her geographical location has dictated where the records have remained. Um, so the records that are now part of the Archives of Ontario were found in, in a house in, in Chatham, Ontario, um, after it was uh, demolished in, in the 70s. Um, and through the good fortune of somebody noticing the stuff in the rubble, uh, was able to save it. Um, so the, the physical records were microfilmed and, and came to the archives of sorry and came to the archives of Ontario and then the physical records have remained in Chatham but they will be coming to us for permanent preservation uh, sometime this fall. Other bits are at uh, Library and Archives Canada and obviously there's m m material at Howard University as well. So I think uh, the land just to, uh, based upon her her physical proximity to to different parcels of the land have, have splintered the collection and in some ways may have limited a, a, an understanding of, of her life a, a, as a whole. Um, the great thing, of course, where we are right now is we have this uh, great equalizer, which is the, the internet and, and uh, the World Wide Web and Zoom and all these things. So we have a real opportunity for land uh, to be less of an issue in bringing uh, intellectual history of, of Marianne Shad Carey together in one place. And I think that'll be something that will be challenging and won't be, shouldn't be such a challenge, but it's something that we'll have to think about doing as part of the 200th anniversary of her, of her birth. I mean, I guess I could say, cause I was just kind of thinking about this, um, the way it shapes collections. Sometimes that's where, you know, collections sometimes need to be in the place where they were developed, you know, the place where they happened, just to really tell the story the best way. Like uh, someone mentioned a collection that we felt didn't need to be at our archive. And so we uh, directed them to a local archive. We said, you know, that's a local story. This collection tells a great local story of the people in this community. So it doesn't need to come here to DC it needs to stay there in that community for the people of that community to have easy access to those records and to that information. And so, you know, we directed them to a local archive there who could better, well, not better preserve, but a local archive there who could preserve that history and make it available. And so that's where, that's where I really see that coming in is making sure that things are 
where they need to be, if that makes sense, you know, at institutions that can really appreciate the records and can really tell that story in relationship to the archive, the community, and their collection. Okay, I'm going to turn to the next question. Um, Marlis, it sounded like your questions were being answered about how could or in what ways can archives, particularly Black archives, be effective to the public humanities and vice versa. Did anybody want to add on to that, um, what's already been discussed? Sorry, and could I, you repeat the question? Sure. Um, how could or in what ways can archives, particularly Black archives, be effective to the public humanities and vice versa? And I, I might add on that to another kind of question is how can um, the long history of black archival practice um, guide or continue to guide and expand the work that we do? I would say for that piece, I would just say, remember the work that has been done. You know, remember the people who've done the work, you know, there are people who've been in this feel for a long time doing this work. That's why I always uplift uh, Dorothy Porter Wesley because sometimes she gets, uh, she doesn't get the respect that she deserves or she's used as kind of just lip service. Oh yeah, she did this. But it's like, no, you don't really understand the impact of what she did. You know, the fact that she created an entire field of description for the black experience when even at her own institution, she faced pushback. You know, that's something that is incredible. Just to me, it's incredible. And so just remembering their work, remembering the examples that they set and their determination, I think really, really will help as we continue to move forward. And in terms of the public humanities piece, I guess I'll just say that I think that Black archives have always contributed to the public humanities piece because they've always been so public facing. And, but I think that, you know, it does need to be done in a way that doesn't necessarily marginalize the community archives and the Black archives. You know, sometimes the work can be done in a space where, oh, yes, let's get all this information out of these archives so you don't have to go there, you know. And then the archive itself is marginalized, you know. So I think that that's something that we do need to keep in mind as we move into that space. But that's a that's a different conversation <laughs> entirely. Yeah, I think from from our perspective, um, certainly as we uh, evolve uh, and we uh, identify collections uh, that maybe haven't been surfaced before, as we bring in new material, as we develop new relationships, uh, there's opportunities for us to sort of rethink the stories we've been telling for, for a long time through our on, on, online exhibits, for example. Um, there's a certain opportunity for us to sort of uh, center uh, Black experiences and, and Black histories in, in many of those stories in a way that wasn't done before. Um, we have opportunities to work with community partners like the Ontario Black History Society um, and partners across the province, frankly, that we haven't been in touch with for a long time before. So the Amherstburg uh, Freedom Museum, for example, in sort of rethinking how we describe um, predominantly Black collections, uh, how we sort of uh, just tell stories differently. I think there's just a, a great opportunity for us to work with uh, uh, with new partners in in recentering or in focusing on 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 black histories in in our storytelling. Okay, uh, the next question. Thank you for that. Um, the next question comes from Dadaja Chaco Green. Um, she asks, um, "How can black archivists get past the structural paradigm where institutional archives are predominantly white and black archives are rendered community?" Uh, it reminds her of Hull, Bell, Scott, and Smith, all, quote, all the women are white, all the Blacks are men, but some of us are brave. 
the question is, are Black archivists and memory workers organizing to ins institutionalize our own collections? I think that we need to support our institutional archives that are Black. And because they do exist, they're just not as kind of, they don't get the attention that other archives get. You know, they don't have the publicity machines to kind of promote themselves and do all of, you know, the public programming that brings attention to them. And so I think that a way to do that is to support the archives at institutions, you know, support Black archives at Black institutions, support Black archives that are with community organizations. And so support these local archives, help them build, help them maintain. You know, it's great to, okay, let me donate something to a large institution so that they can expand the stories that they're telling. But don't forget that there are, you know, our own institutions that have been doing this work, you know, they don't need to go away just because we want to support larger institutions. So I think that that's one of the ways that we can do that is to support these archives that have been preserving and maintaining these histories, even if they aren't the, you know, the shiny, the shiniest penny in the drawer, you know, still realize that they are important and that they need to still exist. Sean or Melissa? I would say in Canada, um, most of the uh, Black archives are privately held. Um, it's just, you know, the, the, the issue is power and privilege and funding, right? So I know the Ontario Black History Society uh, has a funding campaign to create their own archive and museum and library. Uh, I don't know about any other Black institutions that are looking to do so, but that's something that could possibly change within Canada where we do have our own institutional archive, uh, but currently it's largely privately held. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's, an, it's an issue of, of power and privilege, and that is, that is why the language kind of reflects that. Yeah, I think most archives in in Canada are institutional archives. There, there's uh, there's not the same breadth of of uh, diversity amongst in archival institutions as there might be in 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 the states. Um, but they are emerging. So, for example, uh, there's the Muslims in Canada archives that's just been developing out of U of T. Um, as I said, the Wild Seed Center is looking at building an archives. The Ontario Black History Society is having discussions about that. So I think the role for us to play in any of those um, any of those developments is to really think in terms of how we can be uh, supportive um, in terms of uh, providing any expertise we might have and providing any know-how we might have. In some cases, and this hasn't been explored yet, uh, maybe deaccessioning collections and placing them placing them in in a different uh, in a different location so they can be closer to to the people who want to have access to that material. Uh, but the one thing that we have been doing, which has been really great, is uh, in working with the Muslims in Canada archives, is we've de developed a, evolved a model whereby we're in, in relatively constant conversation. They can call us any point in time to ask us any questions they might have. But we have sort of an understanding that um, they have an acquisitions mandate, um, and we support that. Um, so that if donation offers come to us, uh, we defer to to MICA. Um, and in the same token, they also receive donation offers or they, they, they become aware of collections of um, Muslim Ontarians who they may feel are provincially significant and should be placed at the Archives of Ontario so that we can work together in sort of developing collections, both at the, at the Archives of Ontario and at MICA that will have the same purpose in the end, and that's to document the lives of, of Muslims in, in Ontario and Muslims in Canada where there hasn't been documentation before. So I think that's certainly a way that we can we can move together uh, in a mutually supportive way to ensure that we're, we're, we're meeting the needs of researchers and, and, and communities. Wonderful, thank you. 
Um, we are coming up just about to the end of the Q&A session. So uh, I'm gonna ask this last question and then turn it back to Irene to close us out. Um, Jim Casey asks, can we ask to hear about how the Shad Archival Collections in Ontario, NDC, um, it's thrilling to see the materials digitized for the Moreland Spingarn and to anticipate the ongoing efforts in Ontario. Have any items, themes, or highlights emerged just yet in those collections? Yeah, so uh, I have not been in the Archives of Ontario for coming up on 19 months now. Um, and uh, we we have uh, agreed uh, with uh, with Ed and Maxine Robbins and Chatham Ontario that it's time for the material to be transferred to the to the Archives of Ontario. Um, so once that once we we get an opportunity to do, to do that, right now we're looking at November. Um, then we'll start to take a look at that material, start examining whether there's opportunities for practicum placements. Um, the digitization work will evolve from there. Um, the sort of communications plan will flow out and we'll make sure that uh, community members know about that. Um, but the one thing that's been pretty amazing through this whole process, of course, is, uh, as I said, right now we're speaking what we're speaking amongst ourselves uh, across the continent of, about uh, looking at uh, working with the material to, to, to for a meaningful anniversary. Uh, but within Ontario as well, it's meant that we, we've uh, been reaching out to community members in Chatham-Kent to sort of make sure that everybody agrees that com the material coming to the Archives of Ontario is the best uh, for the physical material. Um, and just, uh, it's giving us a, an amazing opportunity just to sort of be involved you know, with our own local community as well as, well as the international one that we're, we're amongst right now. And I'll just say it's been, uh, since we've digitized the collection, it's been great to see that people have been using it. People uh, reach out and say, you know, I've been using that. And they're like, oh, where's more? So now they think we're hiding things. And they're like, no, we're not hiding it. <laughs> so I'll be excited to hear when that uh, material is available, Sean, so that we can direct people to you. And they can say, where's the, where's the rest? And we can say, go to the Archives of Ontario. Yeah, we, we've also, it's also brought us into contact with Library and Archives Canada, who have a small collection of Marianne Shad Carey material as well. So we'll, we'll be continuing the conversation with them and ensuring that they're doing their part to digitize and make their material available. And as I said, the idea will be like, let's figure out a way that we can bring it all together in one, yeah. in one space so that uh, people can see the breadth of, of her life and career as best as they can through the documents. Yeah, I think the idea of building an aggregator is an awesome opportunity that's presented by you know the internet that we can bring these collections together electronically so you can have one i want to say definitive source but a fairly comprehensive source i don't know about you but every time i say internet i feel old <laughs> i feel like there's another word i should be using some people say interwebs yeah. <laughs> All right, I am going to turn it back to Irene. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here, but especially Lopez Matthews Jr., Sean Smith, Melissa Nelson. This was an absolutely fascinating discussion. And I want to encourage everyone to return for 12 o'clock for our keynote. To tell us more about that, I'm going to invite back uh, Kristen Mariah. Hi, thank you so much, Irene. Um, and thank you, Lopez, Sean, and Melissa. This is such an invigorating panel again. Um, and I feel as if I've learned so much. I'm re-energized. I'm excited about Archives Ontario opening up again. And nah. I'm <laughs> looking forward to, you know, getting my hands dirty and doing this work again. Um, at 12 noon, we've got an amazing um, keynote coming up. It's our second keynote, and that keynote will be delivered by Martha Jones. Um, so please um, join us again at noon for our keynote. Um, immediately following the keynote will be a planning session for the upcoming 200th anniversary of Mary Ann Chad Carey's birth in 2023. I mean, we're excited to see so many people from different organizations and different constituencies here for this panel, and we hope that you'll join us again as we think about how we can all work together um, to observe, commemorate, and again, bring attention um, to Mary Ann Chad Carey and the work of women like her.
Um, so thank you once again to everyone. Um, special thanks to Irene Moore Davis, who just did such an incredible job of moderating this panel. Um, you guys were fantastic. All right, so welcome back guys, and thank you so much for joining us for the remaining session of the Marianne Chad Carey in the Here and Now Symposium. Um, we're gonna go ahead and start off with a reminder of our code of conduct. In accordance with the Center for Black Digital Research's principles, our code of conduct allows CBDR to create the best experience possible for all attendees. We are dedicated to providing a harassment-free environment for everyone, regardless of gender, gender identity and expression, age, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, ethnicity, or religion or lack thereof. We do not tolerate harassment of participants in any form. Sexual language and violent imagery is not appropriate during any aspect of this virtual event or conference, including talks, workshops, parties, social media, such as Twitter or other online media. Thanks guys. So it is my <laughs> privilege and honor um, to introduce our speaker. I wanna remind folks that uh, after the talk, her talk, we will go ahead and do Q&A. So please drop your questions and comments in the chat. Um, let me go ahead and <laughs> say it is such a privilege. It is um, just an overwhelmingly wonderful moment for me to go ahead and introduce Dr. Martha Jones. Her contributions to the field of African-American women's history has indelibly shaped our understanding of our foremothers and in turn, how we understand ourselves and our freedom struggles today with democracy in America. Professor Martha S. Jones is the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor, Professor of History, and a professor at the SNF Agora Institute at John Hopkins University. She is a legal and cultural historian whose work examines how Black Americans have shaped the story of American democracy. Professor Jones is the author of Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All, published in 2020. It was selected as one of the Times 100 must-read books for that year. Her 2018 book, Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America, was winner of the Organization of American Historians Leg a Liberty Legacy Award, which is best book in civil rights history, the American Historical Association Littleton Griswold Prize for best book in American legal history, the American Society of Legal History John Philip Reed Book Award for best book in Anglo-American legal history, and the Baltimore City Historical Society uh, Scholars Honor for 2020. The Professor Jones is also author of All Bound Up Together, The Woman Question African American Public Culture, 1830 to 1900, published in 2007, and co-editor of Toward an Intellectual History of Black Women uh, with UNC Press, published in 2015, as well as numerous articles and essays. Dr. Jones is a public historian, writing for broader audiences at the New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, USA Today, Public Books, Talking Points Memo, Politico, The Chronicle of Higher Education, and Time. She's an uh, exhibition curator for, quote, reframing the color line and uh, proclaiming emancipation at the William L. Clements Library, and an expert consultant for museum film and video productions with the Smithsonian's Natural Portrait Gallery, the Charles Wright Museum of African American History, PBS American Experience, the Southern Poverty Law Center, Netflix, and other publications and productions. Recently, Dr. Jones also announced an unprecedented publishing deal for four books forthcoming on the subject of race, history, slavery, identity, and more. So I speak for everyone in saying congratulations, welcome, and we're elated to have you today, Dr. Martha Jones. Thank you so much, Brandy, for um, that welcome. Um, before I begin, um, I want to um, thank you. I want to thank everyone um, in front of the camera and behind the scenes at the Center for Black Digital Research. Um, we so often uh, draw upon that metaphor um, about the shoulders upon which we stand. Um, but I know you all already know um, that my work, um, much of it would not be possible without 
um, the collaboration, the partnership, um, the foundation and more that you all um, have lain for so many of us. I'm really um, here um, in part um, because of so many of you and the ongoing work that we have done um, on the life and the legacies of Marianne Shad Carey. Um, it's an extraordinary honor um, to be here um, among so many folks um, fresh to the subject of Mary Ann Shad Carey, um, along with the opportunity to hear from the extraordinary Jane Rhodes, um, whose book, um, Mary Ann Shad Carey, The Black Press and Protest in the 19th Century, remains our guide. Um, published in 1998, um, what a tribute to a book um, that it stands that test of time. And still, um, I think this is my third copy because I keep giving it away and loaning it. And so there it is. Um, but here, um, for me, when I was a graduate student in the mid 1990s, and I was um, looking to find my way, frankly, to Black women's history um, in an academy that really didn't quite yet wholly recognize um, who we were and what we brought to the table and where we were going. Um, it was book, uh, books like that of Dr. Rhodes that really um, served as a kind of beacon um, for someone like me. Um, so it's an incredible honor to um, share this program with her um, and with all of you. So during yesterday's panel, um, I didn't know that uh, Brandy Locke was gonna be introducing me, but I was on the edge of my seat as I listened to her um, presentation. And um, I partly was on the edge of my seat because she pointed out something that I hadn't quite, um, hadn't quite crystallized in my mind, but I'm gonna try and um, uh, paraphrase uh, Brandy, and if I've gotten it wrong, you'll come back and, and tell me um, how I've gotten it wrong. But part of what I took away from your opening comments was um, that we were called upon in part to account for a kind of unevenness in the study of Mary Ann Shedd Carey's uh, life and work. Um, she lives a long life um, across um, many epochs in US history. Um, and you rightly, I think, pointed to the way in which um, we know one Marianne Shedd Carey, and we know her quite well, and she is the pre-Civil War, antebellum, Canada West, provincial freeman Marianne Shedd Carey. Um, but in this life that continues robustly um, through the Civil War and beyond in this um, post-war period, um, we've studied her less. Um, and that felt like a, a really critical intervention um, at a moment like this as we're gearing up to mark um, 200 years um, of her life. Um, so my goal today is in a small way to try and bridge those histories, um, if you will, those two Marianne Shedd carries, um, trying to link her work on the one hand in the provincial freeman in the 1850s um, to her years in Washington, D.C. after the Civil War. Um, my focus today is on Shad Carey um, and her concerns with law um, and her contributions as a legal thinker. Um, I want to center on her as an intellectual, um, as a producer of ideas and more. And I begin with an anecdote. Um, it's now quite a few years ago, um, probably more than a decade, um, when someone asked me who had been the first Black woman graduate of the law school where I was teaching at the time, at the University of Michigan Law School. Now, I was a little embarrassed, truthfully, because I didn't know the answer. Um, and, um, but the question sort of sent me on a modest quest. Um, to learn, in fact, who had been the first Black woman to graduate there. Um, and I headed to the library. Um, it didn't take long. Um, importantly, um, historian J. Clay Smith, um, I learned, you know, who had devoted so much of his work to chronicling the history of Black lawyers and lawyering, he had published an interview with her. Um, and so I met Jane Cleo Marshall Lucas in his book, Rebels in Law, Voices in History, um, in the history of Black women lawyers. 
So Lucas, it turned out, had come to Michigan law after finishing her BA at Howard University um, in uh, 1940. Um, she'd been a student of Radford Logan. And by 1942, Lucas was on her way to earning uh, dual graduate degrees at Michigan in law and political science. So I had discovered, hardly, right? She had been there all the time. But for myself, I had discovered Lucas. And I excitedly called my colleague and mentor, um, Dr. Mary Frances Berry, um, who herself is a holder of two graduate degrees in law and history from Michigan. I wanted to tell her what I'd learned about Lucas. Now, if you've ever had the opportunity to encounter Dr. Berry um, yourself, you already know that there's not very much you can actually tell her. Um, and so she knew um, certainly about Lucas, um, but she listened to me. Um, and then she set me straight. Um, she explained that she knew the story of Lucas, um, but she warned me to be, a, be wary of stories that turned on the notion of black firsts. Her point was that to celebrate them too emphatically is to cover over the story of those who come before. Now, in our conversation about Lucas, um, this meant that if I spent too much time heralding, if you will, Lucas as the first graduate, um, insisting that she be remembered, we might be in danger of overlooking um, those who had tried, um, who had attempted, who had strived, um, who had even failed. Um, that the whole story of Black women at an institution like Michigan Law, um, but not only at Michigan Law, was one that needed to include the Black women who had aspired, um, who had aimed, who had attempted the law school, um, but had not, like Lucas, actually graduated. And when I dug deeper into Lucas's story, um, I recognized that she herself hinted at this sort of dilemma when she, account, when she recounted her experience at Michigan Law. Um, and in a moment, an incident, what uh, she described as the only suggestion of prejudice during her years there. It happened nearly the very first day when she showed up to register. And this is Lucas speaking. A middle-aged white lady who was probably the head clerk said to me, you're not the first colored girl to enter the law school. None of them finished. We'll see what you do. There it was, a slim bit of evidence of that broader story. Right? The experiences of those women invoked in the phrase, none of them. Those were the women that Dr. Barry had insisted were essential companions to Jane Cleo Marshall Lucas, even if they did not march with her um, at commencement. So as I returned, and, um, and I'm so grateful for this opportunity to return once again um, to Mary Ann Shad Carey's time and some of the mysteries about her time at Howard Law School, Dr. Barry's insights um, and the story of Jane Cleo Marshall Lucas um, stayed with me. Lucas, unlike Shad Carey, was that black woman first. She graduated from Michigan Law in 1946. At Howard, Shad Carey was for a long time, we thought, among the none of them, as in the none who ever finished. Um, so I went back to that interview with Lucas. Um, she had gone on to be the first black woman to be admitted to the Maryland Bar in 1946. Later that year, she joined Howard University's law school as the first woman full-time faculty member. So even as Lucas and Shad Carey are separated um, by decades, um, by epics even in our history, um, for me, it's sure that they lived lives that were intertwined um, by ambition, by institutions, and by the dilemma that has surrounded how a Black woman might secure a legal education and then what she might do with it. Now, historian James Rhodes has explained that in September of 1869, Mary Ann Shad Carey joined the first bona fide law class at Howard University Law School. 
she was the only woman among the 46 members, a class that also included her younger brother, um, Abraham Shad. Um, she was a first, the first woman to enroll, and it was a formidable undertaking. Shad Gary kept up her work as a teacher and principal during the day while taking law classes at night. She lived on campus, took part in evening study groups while caring for two children. Rhodes found evidence of Shad Carey's performance in a July 1870 presentation in which a reporter praised her clear, incisive analysis of one of the most delicate legal questions. The subject matter was the origin and necessity of corporations. And that I made a note of something to think more about. Um, but if Shad Carey appeared to excel, Rhodes didn't find evidence that she completed her studies immediately there at Howard. When the law school held its first commencement in February 1871, Mary Ann Shad Carey was not among the 10 graduates, though her brother Abraham was. And as Rhodes explains, the why of Shad Carey's failure to complete her law studies then um, has been the subject of some puzzlement among historians. Um, this group I know knows that the longer story of how Shad Carey returned to Howard in the 1880s though whether it was to complete her studies or for the formality of having her degree confirmed is frankly still a, a, unclear to me. Um, but we do know that by the 1880s, she adds Esquire um, to her name, and this becomes part of her professional identity. And as best I can tell, this remains a, a contested part of her history. Um, do a survey of writings about Shad Carey, both scholarly and popular, um, and you will find varying versions of this story. And I'd be interested to hear today from anybody, or at any time from anybody who might wanna um, uh, tell me how they've puzzled through that question. But that's not quite my purpose today. Um, I don't wanna revisit that turn of events. Instead, I wanna offer another view, I hope a broader view of the story of Marianne Shad um, and her early, she had Carrie in her early time at Howard Law School. And I want to suggest that when we constrain that story to a framework of firsts, when we reduce it to a matter of whether she did or did not graduate, we actually miss an opportunity to explore what I think is an important thread in her life as a thinker, that of her thinking about the Constitution. So let's go back um, and set Shad Carey's legal training in some, I think, useful context. Um, when we imagine her, I think, embarking on legal training um, there in the 1860s um, as she entered Howard Law, um, I think oftentimes our imaginations comport with 21st century uh, sensibilities about how Americans get to the bar, how they practice. And so it's worthwhile to recall that at the middle of the 19th century, that was only one and hardly the most common route to becoming a lawyer. Um, prior to 1870 and really through to the 1890s, um, when Shad Carey entered Howard's Law, most legal practitioners gained their training not by formal schooling at all, but instead by way of a tutorial relationship during which they privately read and this is a term of art, they read law under the guidance of an experienced practitioner. The goal was to gain a sufficient understanding of law and then to evidence that before a judge who examined the candidate and then ruled on their admission to the bar. Law school training was an alternative route, but not the one that most American lawyers had taken in the, by the 1860s. Rather than attending law school or degree program, um, especially for black lawyers who were barred from American law schools for much of the early 19th century, um, there has to be another route. And we don't have to look far from Mary Ann Shedd Carey's circle to discern that because Howard Law School's founding dean, John Mercer Langston, um, from Ohio, after he finishes his MA in theology at Oberlin, read law with Philemon Bliss, an abolitionist and member of Congress. Um, this was a wholly voluntary arrangement. Bliss accepted to tutor uh, Langston, independent of any structure or requirement that he do, do so, independent of any educational institution. The two succeeded and Langston was examined and admitted to the Ohio Bar in 1854. Um, and the quality of their work together mattered 
um, as did Bliss's reputation, which furthered Langston's effort and his standing before the judge who admitted him. Now, Langston's story is exceptional in some ways. He's the first Black American to be admitted to the bar in Ohio, but it was a rather ordinary course, um, this reading of law with an expert um, that got him there. Still, Bliss's office wasn't the only place that John Mercer Langston had studied law. He, like many Black men of his generation, had been part of the colored convention movement where understanding law, especially the US Constitution, um, was a central concern. Um, as early as 1851, black men in Ohio were not only coming together, they were publishing pamphlets to which they instructed one another in the terms and the meanings, uh, of terms and the means for amending their state constitution. They, for example, addressed um, a state constitutional convention that year on how it might, or maybe better put how it should amend the state's governing tax by striking out the word white so that black men would be permitted to cast ballots in Ohio. The pamphlet was more than an instrument of advocacy. It was surely that, but it was also a learned text approximating a legal treatise on the matter of equality before the law. It's an impressive document. In the colored conventions, it had been true from the outset that black men came together from New England, the Mid-Atlantic, as far south as Virginia, to discuss the rise of black laws, the prospect of leaving the US. They studied the Constitution, teaching themselves how to comprehend and then wield it in the interests of their rights. As far back as the inaugural convention in 1830, among the delegates were men from Ohio who that early were being driven out of their state by discriminatory black laws. Um, one member of that convention, Hezekiah Grice, um, came home to Baltimore um, with that dilemma in mind, and he organized the, the Legal Rights Association in Baltimore, aiming to prove that black Americans were citizens before the US Constitution. His partner was William Watkins, an educator and commentator in the anti-slavery press. Um, and they wrote about the Constitution um, as a companion to the Declaration of Independence, as obliged to the Declaration's ideals um, and its promise to all men, um, all men born free, guaranteed certain rights, inalienable rights. Um, Watkins wrote, the Declaration of Independence is our advocate, and we hope it will yet be ascertained whether or not the Constitution secures to us those rights with the con which the Declaration so freely accords. So here we are, um, even before someone like Mary Ann Shad Carey um, enters um, the public realm, um, a tradition of studying, understanding, teaching the Constitution um, is, has been generated and is being practiced in the colored conventions. Um, and here, um, enter Mary Ann Shad Carey and her provincial freeman in the 1850s. Um, hadn't she been already studying law to the degree she'd been tuning into these conventions? Um, hadn't she indeed been studying law for a very long time before she actually enrolls at Howard Law School? Hadn't she not only been a student of the Constitution, hadn't she provided on the pages of the provincial freeman a means for reading law? for many black Americans for whom the doors of law offices and law schools remained shut. Now, it won't surprise many of you that um, uh, I've spent a lot of time with the provincial freeman, um, and it is um, in some ways styled as a kind of open forum. Um, but I think today we know um, the extraordinary influence, the hand of Mary Ann Shad Carey and how it is shaping um, what makes it into print in the provincial freeman. Um, here, um, she is someone who is um, curating um, and um, offering up um, a series of lessons. Um, in my work, um, important lessons on the history of um, women's, um, women's rights and particularly women's votes. Um, and the questions that swirl through those possibilities at the middle of the 19th century. Um, but it turns out 
um, thinking about constitutions was as fundamental um, as we're thinking about women's rights um, on the page of the, of the provincial freemen. Read the um, opening prospectus of the provincial freemen um, and you will see how constitutional thinking fits. Um, there she is in Canada West in the 1850s. Um, she's discerned um, in the British constitutional framework a set of principles that look to sideline, in her view, anti-Black racism, to open the door to full citizenship. The founding prospectus advises readers that the paper has reserved the right to express emphatic condemnation of all projects having for their object in a great or remote degree the subversion of the principles of the British constitution. A view about law, vigilant, critical, purposeful, sat at the foundation of Shad Carey's bold undertaking in the provincial freedmen. And readers were on notice in a sense that they needed to study up. Um, she was gonna help them. And even as she premised her work on the provincial freemen and the liberties guaranteed to her in Canada West, Shed Carey never, as we know, wholly diverted her gaze from struggles in the US. Um, among the critical issues of the mid 1850s, the years during which she was at work as publisher, consequential debates were roiling in the US about slavery's future, about the possibility of its demise, about the standing of formerly enslaved people of free black Americans. Many of these turned on the US constitution and Shad Carey walked readers through that document, training their minds in how law along with political and moral philosophy might determine their interests and even their fates. For example, was the constitution a pro or an anti-slavery text? This was a longstanding debate among US abolitionists. It had splintered alliances among activists, most infamously between Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison, um, who differently regarded the constitution. Was it a covenant with slaveholders or was it a promise of a more perfect and free soil nation? From the provincial freemen, readers learned not only how some abolitionists but how some of slavery's most staunch supporters viewed the Constitution as safeguarding the institution of slavery, especially as a matter of property interests. And politics derived directly from this view of the Constitution. She introduces Franklin Pierce, uh, newly elected president in 1854. I believe that involuntary servitude as it exists in different states of this confederacy is recognized by the constitution. I stand, believe that it stands like any other admitted right and that the states where it exists are entitled to efficient remedies to enforce the constitutional provision. Southern planters, Shad Carey revealed, believed much the same. Slaveholding was a constitutionally derived right. The master, when his right is questioned, is to answer that he holds his work people as property under the constitution. So here readers discovered that while the US constitution never expressly addressed slavery, indeed never used the word slave or slavery in its text, it was a document whose provisions such as the three fifths clause, the prohibition against interfering with the slave trade and the power to put down domestic insurre insurrections, these provisions were all understood to buttress, to rationalize, to justify enslavements in the minds of some abolitionists and certainly in the minds of many of slavery's proponents. What about anti-slavery? Well, it's essential for readers of the provincial freemen um, to learn the lesson in the vagaries of constitutional interpretation. Um, what happens when such a text runs afoul of natural law principles, such as those set forth in the Declaration of Independence? Wasn't there an inherent contradiction between the Constitution's commitments to liberty, to due process, and its use as a pro-slavery instrument? These were questions that readers discovered through the provincial freemen were live, prominent, and they discovered how learned and even powerful figures were debating them. For example, they met Henry Ward Beecher, um, the minister and reformer 
who look to resolve these tensions in the Constitution and threatened that the nation couldn't persist um, with them intact. It's utterly impossible for slavery and liberty to exist under the same Constitution without conflicts and agitations. Now, Beecher doesn't know that civil war is on the horizon, but he understands the ways in which the Constitution right, has created a set of contradictions um, that must be resolved. Abolitionist uh, William Goodell's book, The American Jubilee, um, was quoted in the Provincial Freeman. Um, the Constitution of the U.S. was an anti-slavery document, good old urged. Um, that is, it was a document that can and should be mobilized, amended, and wielded to defeat slavery and restore the nation to the best of its founding ideals. The provincial freemen, not surprisingly, I don't think, followed the colored conventions and demonstrated for readers how the Constitution was being interpreted and promoted there. An 1855 meeting was typical in pressing on an anti-slavery view of the text. No person shall be deprived of liberty without due process of law. This is an invocation of the U.S. Constitution. This was a principle that even pro-slavery thinkers revered um, so how could it be then that the Constitution was a pro-slavery document when enslavement itself was the deprivation of liberty without cause or process? Black Americans, um, the conventions urged and the provincial freemen amplified um, must resist on this point. And um, men in Ohio um, in convention um, reject the notion that slavery is a national institution um, one that the Constitution recognizes wherever it goes. Um, this is not a great, great slave empire, um, is, the con is, the, is the convention's conclusion. So here, to interpret the Constitution was to make a powerful claim about the nation of the uh, nature of the nation itself. History mattered for understanding the Constitution, and the provincial freeman provides lessons. Um, in historical thinking about the origins of the Constitution and its terms, about its framers. Um, hadn't there been discussion, even in the months spent drafting the 1787 Constitution, that were clearly anti-slavery in their sensibilities? Shouldn't James Madison's reluctant to use the word, reluctance to use the word slave in the Constitution be read as evidence of the document's anti-slavery subtext, if not intent, these are the kinds of debates that are animating constitutional interpretation in the 1850s, but it's important to say they are the kinds of debates that continue to animate constitutional interpretation today. Um, and so this approach that we sometimes refer to as originalism, um, Shad Carey is teaching um, the readers of the provincial freemen. So study of the Constitution um, in the 1850s requires nuanced thinking about the principle of federalism. Now, this is where people's eyes glaze over, I'm sure, um, but I'm going to insist because Shad Carey insisted that we understand the ways in which the principle of federalism and the way in which it bifurcated, it divided, it um, allocated um, the power of law and governance in the United States was one of the significant hurdles to tackling the question and the project of slavery's abolition. Federalism recognized this dualism and the Constitution sought to allocate zones of jurisdiction. For example, federal authorities had exclusive power over foreign relations, war, and immigration. While the Constitution left to individual states governance of civil institutions, of criminal law, and even of voting rights. This structure, readers of the provincial freemen learned, had profound consequences for slavery and Black life. Um, it produced a nation in which Black Americans fared unevenly, depending upon where they were born or found themselves, who should determine the legality of slavery in any given state. And what about U.S. territories that sought to enter the Union? How should the status of Black people there be determined? Did Congress have any authority at all to regulate slavery, or was it wholly a so-called domestic institution governed by the states? 
provincial freeman readers learned that in California, for example, the matter of whether that state would permit slaveholding was actually the subject of a debate that turned in part on a constitutional puzzle, this puzzle of federalism. When Indiana looked to regulate the lives of free people of color, was that permissible in light of a federal constitution that guaranteed to all citizens the same privileges and immunities? Article 13 of the Constitution of Indiana prohibited so-called colored people from settling in the state, Chad Carey reported. And then she quipped, we thought the Constitution of the United States guaranteed the citizens of one state all the rights and privileges of the citizens of every other state. Not so, it seemed, for Black Americans. So from the founding, readers learned that Black Americans had been couching their claims to equality in constitutional terms. Um, and Shad Carey set their struggles of the 1850s in that long and important history. Now, there are a couple of um, extraordinary uh, moments where constitutional thinking is essential um, for readers of the provincial freemen um, in the 1850s. The first is in thinking through and understanding and grappling with the aftermath of the fugitive slave law. Um, so here, um, federal officials have now um, vested um, private parties, um, northern officials and more um, in the project of um, slaveholders capture of so-called fugitives. Um, does the Constitution provide a remedy? Um, one that would invalidate this law that has come out of Congress, search the pages of the provincial freemen. And Shad Carey there offers up sometimes glimmers of hope, um, pronouncements that declare the fugitive slave law unconstitutional, but just as often she provides examples of legal authorities, including US courts um, in places like Cincinnati, um, who remand fugitives black to enslavement um, by the very terms of this federal law. The cruelty of the law's enforcement was equally offensive as a constitutional matter. Um, the provincial freeman reported on a Kentucky case, emphatically, is here contained. A free Negro, a man endowed by the Constitution of the United States with all the blessings which may be derived from liberty, and the free pursuit of happiness for the mere crime of living in Kentucky, he must be arrested, thrust into jail, and a most diabolical attempt made to send him to the penitentiary. Um, yes, this was a moral question, a political question, but it was also a constitutional question as part of what Shad Carey came to teach in the pages of the provincial freemen. The other major um, matter um, of the 1850s is the Dred Scott case. Um, and the provincial freeman follows that case um, long before um, in 1857, the Supreme Court issues its final ruling. Um, but here, I want to remind us that part of what um, we need to discern and to puzzle through in order to understand um, the wholly the implications of Dred Scott is the problem of federalism. So Shad Carey had been preparing her readers um, for the complexities of Dred Scott, because while we remember that decision importantly and significantly for its declaration um, that no black person enslaved or free can be a citizen of the United States, this was also a decision that invalidated acts of Congress that had regulated slavery in US territories um, it troubled the federalism's arrangement um, by, in essence, invalidating the authority of Congress to regulate slavery um, in federal territories. That was to be left now um, to the new states to determine for themselves as they entered the Union. Um, so here, readers learn um, the degree to which the Constitution had seemingly granted Congress sovereign power over the territories and then had snatched it back um, by way of a Supreme Court decision um, that invalidated that authority. Um, here, Dred Scott is not simply a betrayal of the interests and the concerns of Black Americans. It is a betrayal of the Constitution itself. And this interpretation one that Shad Carey teaches to her readers 
is a view that will take um, them not simply through the 1850s, but on through to Reconstruction, um, as in the wake of the Civil War, the Constitution will be amended by way of the revolution of Reconstruction. Um, it is necessary um, to appreciate those contours of Dred Scott um, to then weigh in on the significance, particularly of the 14th and the 15th Amendments, and how they reorder that relationship between the states and the federal government um, in, the, um, in the wake of the Civil War's revolution. So where is Marianne Shedd Carey in this? Um, she is an interesting um, thinker in this moment, um, because as I see it, um, as someone who is a proponent in these years of emigration, um, her position is um, a complicated one, which is to say her position is one that exploits these um, narrow readings of the Constitution, these pro-slavery readings of, this, of the Constitution, these betrayals of the principles of the Declaration in the Constitution. She's someone who, yes, is a critic of those on the one hand, but the real crux for Shad Carey um, goes something like, um, when are Black Americans in the United States going to realize, to wake up, to recognize um, the ways in which the weight of constitutional interpretation, the power of those like the U.S. Supreme Court who are interpreting the Constitution and more are working increasingly against them. And this is, um, while lamentable, um, precisely the kind of um, fuel, the kind of ammunition that Shad Carey um, uh, trades in uh, to promote um, to continue to promote emigration. Um, she writes at one point, um, we shall wait with patience to see what it will do for them. We hope, however, that they too will look at facts instead of everlastingly theorizing. Who are the they? Um, it is Black Americans who continue to have a faith in the U.S. Constitution. It is Shad Carey says that is a false faith, that is a false hope, um, and folks should come over to the project of emigration if they understand the U.S. Constitution. Um, that conclusion is irresistible. So in my last few minutes, I want to um, do that thing I promised I would do, which is to um, try and bridge this story of the antebellum Marianne Shad Carey um, with the Marianne Shad Carey of the post-Civil War period. Um, yes, um, she enrolls at Howard Law School. Um, but I want to suggest to us um, it's a mistake to think that her legal acumen, her insights into the U.S. Constitution, um, its promise, its possibilities, its malleability, and more um, cannot be wholly ascribed um, to her brief stint at Howard Law, um, especially when we appreciate that she is going to bring her legal acumen to an issue uh, and a question um, that is hardly on the front burner at Howard, and that is the issue of women's suffrage. Um, Marianne Shad Carey, when she comes to the debate over women's voting rights, um, yes, brings with her, again, a set of moral and philosophical principles, um, but she also brings keen insight into the Constitution. Um, and here, um, uh, many of us have read, I'm sure, but I'll share again her remarks um, before a federal judiciary committee in the 1870s, um, comments that are aimed at winning um, a revision to the existing laws of the District of Columbia. Here, um, she urges that Congress um, amend the law to uh, excise, to remove the word male um, from uh, the laws that governed voting rights in the district without delay. There's Mary Ann Shed Carey, emphatic as always. Um, she is leading um, now this movement um, to, um, in an to an important degree, um, set their sights on Congress um, as the 
um, body that will um, ultimately realize um, women's voting rights in the United States. Um, and she fr frames um, the terms, the existing terms of the law in the district is discrimination um, against women. Um, women should vote as men do um, before being further taxed. Um, and here she urges this is um, an opportunity for Congress to govern the district um, and to permit the district to be governed um, by its residents, by its citizens, um, by their own consent, um, invoking the principles of the founders um, that she had so importantly introduced to readers of the provincial um, freemen. So I'll end um, just by saying that um, uh, Thank you, first of all, um, for this opportunity um, for me to revisit Marianne Shad Carey um, and her thinking um, and to appreciate um, that uh, while um, there is more to learn, I take it about um, the question of her um, time at Howard Law School, um, her status as a first um, or not a first, um, more importantly, in my view, um, we have this opportunity to attend to her ideas, um, to not only appreciate her evolving thinking about the Constitution, but the role she plays um, in um, permitting Black Americans to be very much a part of those early debates and prepared, frankly, for the critical debates that will characterize the 1860s um, and beyond. Um, I'm indebted very much um, here to you all, um, to um, the Colored Conventions Project, um, to the Center for Black Digital Research. I want to shout out um, my colleagues from uh, the Black Women's Intellectual and Cultural History Collective, um, which um, who um, some years ago now really um, instilled in me um, this um, imperative that we think about women like Marianne Shad Carey um, as thinkers as well as doers. Um, and I'm going to um, say thank you again to Brandy Locke, um, who I think is going to join me um, for uh, conversation and questions. And thank you again so much, um, Brandy, for um, sharing uh, this time with me. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. Um, I think I speak for everyone when I say your talk was incredible. Um, and it's thrilling to see this sort of simmering, underlining conversation about Mary Ann Shad Carey as a legal thinker be really lifted up to the surface as this through line um, that all of us are, are subtly grappling with um, in all of the arenas she's working with. So we do have some questions uh, that seek to connect uh, the various interests of our participants today um, with, your, with your expertise and thoughts there. Um, so I'd like to begin with a question that I'm going to rephrase um, a little bit from um, Errol Henderson, uh, which is a question about uh, to what extent uh, do we see Mary Ann Jad Carey in particular, but perhaps we can speak also to um, over the course of her life as it applies here. Uh, the relationship between um, the you know black feminist ideals, um, the the place and presence of black women in organizing and and in uh, black and in particular black na black nationalist projects um, across her lifetime, as it pertains or connects to uh, her legal thought and her her and her peers working through that space of uh, our zone of exploration around where do black women fit? Where can we fit based on the constitution? Where do we situate ourselves or reinterpret things? Yeah. Um, th so thank you for that question. Um, I, I have two thoughts. Um, you know, the first is that um, I think it's important to appreciate um, the degree to which um, Shad Carey, as um, distinct as she is in many ways, 
um, you know, is the inheritor already, certainly by the 1850s, um, of a, a political tradition, um, of a set of ideas, um, of a political critique and more um, that we associate with black feminist thought. Um, that is to say, um, she is, um, you know, a daughter of Mariah Stewart. Um, you know, she is a daughter of um, Sarah Maps Douglas. Um, she is already, right, standing on the shoulders of black women who um, in oftentimes less um, uh, overtly um, or obviously political realms um, like literary societies, like churches and more um, have been already hammering out um, a, a political critique, that critique that we come to call intersectionality um, by the end of the 20th century um, she is an inheritor of that. And so I think that's one piece um, that if we dwell too long, right, on her singularity, um, we might miss the ways in which she is, she is inheriting um, a great deal. That's one view. Um, the other thing I'd say is that I think that um, my view is... Um, uh, maybe different than some, is that I see um, Shed Carey um, is much more um, connected to, in, in, with intentionality um, and with purpose in her own ways to other Black women activists, um, to her peers. Um, and Frances Ellen Watkins Harper um, comes to mind for me. She should come to mind for everybody, if I could put it that way, um, here. And it was only recently, you know, that I went back to look at how she um, reported on, how she covered, how she commented on Frances Harper um, in the 1850s. And she's not only an admirer of Harper, um, you know, she really lauds Harper as someone um, in a, in a, with a style um, and with a, 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 a way um, uh, that is very different than that of Shed Carey. She, she really respects um, uh, uh, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Um, they share mentors, men like William Still. Um, and so I think she's much, she's more connected, um, I think, to that story than we've sometimes given her um, credit for. Um, and of course, these are women who are, um, laying the foundation, if you will, for what becomes, you know, the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. She's, uh, um, Shad Carey herself is going to pass away just nearly on the eve of that organization's founding. Um, but um, I think she's um, very much a part of that story rather than someone who is sort of exceptional stands um, outside of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I it, I just wanted to say that in that same speech to um, the Judicial Committee in DC, there's this moment that I had a, a, a momentary literary student sort of, you know, nerd moment where I was like, oh my gosh, she is a brilliant legal scholar and, you know, also very aware of how to work a room when she's talking about the Constitution and she's reminding folks about the history of the building of this country as being through the labor of black women she's evoking this black woman's body and she's standing in front of them as a black woman and it's like you cannot you cannot escape this we're we're part of this we're stitched into this material and um you know that that to me spells just a, a fantastic legal mind that i'm glad we're having this conversation about so so thank you and i i want to go ahead and read a, a question from rj Boutel. Um, he says, Dr. Jones's description of black uh, lawyers relying on alternative methods of training outside law schools and the Bar Association have me thinking about our panelists' remarks this morning about how black archival and memory workers have often labored outside formal institutions because of the limitations and prejudices that structure those institutions. It feels important to continue thinking about the risks and rewards of working within institutions as we look ahead to 2023. And so I'm wondering if you would like to go ahead and comment about 
um, you know, the, the legal institutions that are also, you know, uh, contextualizing and framing her, her development as a thinker and determining her, her legal actions or lack thereof. Yeah, um, I, I, I appreciate that analogy um, so much because I think there is, um, uh, there is in a way, I think, you know, in Marianne Shad Carey, right, a, a brand of, of, of strength, a brand of capacity um, that is very much born right, of being an outsider. Right and being on the margins, and um, I think you have to, I feel like I have to be careful with that, right? Because I, I, I wouldn't want that take to fuel the sense that there was something laudable right, about that exclusion. Um, but at the same time, I think that her capacity for creative, right, unorthodox, cutting edge thinking about many questions, right, is um, in part a function of, you know, the deep assumption, right, that she is going to um, occupy um, a kind of margins um, always, right? I mean, think about it. From the beginning, you know, the first time she sets on the public stage, it's never clear to me, right, whether, you know, it's sort of her forays and her challenges to male leaders come first, or, you know, they've already got those critiques in their pocket, right? I mean, they're, you know, they haven't invented them for her. Um, and so I think that um, how that might sort of um, uh, inform our work in 2023 um, is thinking about sort of not only who we convene, but where we convene, um, and by what terms we convene. Um, so on the so on the one hand, we continue to benefit from I think the the cutting edge, the unorthodox, and more, and um, and help let those folks help us. Um, those of us who are deeply institutionalized, um, you know, uh, you know, wherever we, you know, wherever we put down our shovel, like we're deeply institutionalized, and um, and so I think that's a challenge, but I think it's a worthy one to take on. Um, and aren't there still, right, the Mary Ann Shad Carries among us, very much so. Um, who um, help those of us, you know, who work in much more conventional ways to do our best work or our better work, at least. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, let's see what else, what other questions we have. All right. What can we learn about working within and outside of institutions from Shad Carey's writing experience? Uh, but more importantly, what challenges persist? Um, and what are, what are some openings and opportunities that you see in terms of future uh, Shad Carey writings and experiences? So if, if you had the opportunity, let's say, to take this today's talk and um, you know, turn it into uh, a lecture series or you know, something that a grad student like myself would sign up for in a heartbeat, what would that look like um, or other areas in terms of her history um, and her story? that you'd yeah. like to see expanded? You know, I, I, so two things I want to say, you know, one is, um, and it connects to the prior question too, you know, we know well the story of um, Shed Carey's struggles around um, editorship of the provincial Freeman and how even stepping into her own, uh, her own, right, newspaper space, um, means she stepped into right a, a, a world right of publishing um, of the press of newspapers and um, and she is compromised right it, she wrestles with the compromise right of what it means and um, and how if at all she's going to um, show readers that um, there is a woman at the helm of that so I think that um, she provides some you know, cautionary tales, maybe, um, uh, you know, um, about what happens, right, when we, when we, um, when we build, when we do. I'm sure there's conversations behind the scenes 
there with you all, right, in your work about what it means to do the work. But for me, if I were free, and some days I'm more free than others, um, but if I were free, um, I think I would take a, a strong lesson from your keynote yesterday um, about the um, the way in which I participate in this bifurcation and this distance between African American history and Afro Canadian history, for example. And I think that one of the things we could do in a seminar, right, would be to further um, wrestle with that and to theorize that and to. Um, make that a part of um, the way in which we tell this story. In my talk, uh, I don't spend any time on the notion of a British constitution, which is not a text at all. It's a, it's a common law principle. Um, and, um, and that is a, 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 an artifact, right, of, of my bifurcated way of thinking about North America that imagines I don't have to dwell very long on and explain to you all um, what it is, what is we mean differently when we say the British Constitution versus the US Constitution. So I think we could spend um, time on that. Um, and I do think that, um, and one of the things I tried to do in Vanguard was to really think about um, generationally about this story. And so, I think that um, today, if I were to teach um, Shad Carey, um, there would be an important question about the arc of her life, right? And it is an extraordinary arc um, when we recognize that she lives until the 1890s. Um, and that is the tension, isn't it, between, um, or I'll say for me, that is the tension between um, sort of biographically driven histories and um, histories um, that take their sensibilities and their frameworks from social and political history. Um, so how do we, on the one hand, continue to build this um, sort of biographical right, interpretation of Shad Carey on the one hand, but how do we use that to embed her in social and political histories in ways that she no longer is simply exceptionalized as an individual and she becomes an essential companion to a Frederick Douglass or a Martin Delaney. Um, we're just not there at all. Um, and I'm, I think it would be wonderful to explore how to use biography better to get her there. Absolutely. I totally thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I want to go ahead and pose a question from Dr. Foreman. Uh, we have a few more questions left. Um, Dr. Foreman writes, I'm always taken by uh, Mary Ann Shad Carey's much younger brother Abraham's graduation from law school, his move south, his run for office in Mississippi, and his work uh, with early judge Mifflin Gibbs in Arkansas. Can you talk about gendered circuits of legal development? and access in the postbellum era. Right. I mean, so um, thank you for that, Dr. Foreman. And um, did you want to jump in, Dr. Foreman? I, I just wanted to say that um, Juwan Wu also um, brought up Isaac, right? Her brother who, who does run um, in Mississippi and becomes a state legislature. So just to amplify the question more. Yeah, so thank you. Um, you know, this is the... Um, uh, this moment in the early 1870s is um, one uh, that I think, um, so this is just me kind of, um, as we do, kind of imagining, speculating, right? But I think there's, it's a fascinating coincidence, right? That Shad Carey kind of falls out, right, of the, the formal uh, law study, um, right at the moment that um, the U.S. Supreme Court is going to tell American women generally, right, that there is no right to be admitted to the bar, um, and the Constitution does not guarantee women um, any right to be lawyers at all. Um, and and so and the timing feels um, uh, important um, for understanding. Um, Shad Carey, even as the folks who are bringing that litigation are not concerned at all with Black women and, and the, the 
the distinct impediments that are going to keep Black Americans, including Black women, um, from the bar for a long time in many places. Um, Shed Carey is someone who is sort of engaged enough, right, with the, the politics of women's rights and suffrage across the color line um, that I would love to know more about how she's thinking about that and how that is um, shaping her. So it's to say, right, that um, she and her brothers stand in very different shoes um, in this regard. And I went back to look, um, you know, in the Howard collection, there is um, I, what I take to be her, um, uh, her copy of the graduation, the commencement uh, program, um, where Abraham um, uh, graduates, and she does not. Um, and there, there's that handwritten note to her, right, sis, right, I, I, I'm about to be admitted to the bar, I might be heading your way. And um, I would love to treat that as an opening, right, for um, we get sort of his um, rather um, almost lighthearted, right, you know, and, and clearly excited and, and sort of proud um, take on that moment and, and no acknowledgement, no hint, right, about where her mind is in this very same moment when it appears, right, that she may have stepped away altogether from her law studies. Um, so um, Dr. Foreman has a big question, right, about um, sort of the, the, the gendered landscape. Um, you know, my broader view um, is that um, Black women are working a different set of concerns um, than our white women, right, who are indeed looking to use the 14th Amendment to get themselves the right to vote, admitted to the bar, um, and more. Um, on the one hand, and, and black men, right, who are, um, you know, very much, um, have very much centered the, the project of political rights, including the project of office holding. Um, this is the, the 1870s is the moment of, um, you know, Hall versus DeQueer and, and Josephine DeQueer, who is going to challenge her, um, relegation right to second class accommodations on uh, a, 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 a boat headed up the Mississippi River um, that black women are turning to um, concerns about um, travel about violence about sexual violence um, and um, that is not simply that is partly an artifact of sort of the the gendered landscape um, but it is also, um, I think, a, a deliberate a distinction, right, between the ways in which Black women are thinking about rights and thinking about politics and more um, that runs counter to the ways in which white women are thinking about that and Black women are thinking, about, Black men are thinking about that in the, in the same mm -hmm. moment. So I hope that makes a little sense. But. Yes, and, and thank you so much. And I do want to um, let everyone know. Unfortunately, we have run out of time on the Q and A, but we, we, you know, we have all of these wonderful questions still and conversations still simmering the chat. So I want to encourage folks to hold tight to those because we still have more coming, um, and to really think through all of the generative ways Dr. Jones's talk has, you know, uh, brought light to questions and topics that reach across various states and borders and topics. Um, and, and this is just the beginning. So thank you again, Dr. Jones. It has been an honor and a pleasure to have you. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Dr. Foreman. We wanna thank you again, Brandy, for moderating this great session. All the questions that um, were both posed um, in the chat, but also the conversations that are had in the chat. And then we want to thank um, both of our keynote speakers, but today particularly Dr. Jones, um, for being the perfect speaker to, to bring the questions about Mary Ann Shag Carey's legal thinking and thinking as, a, as an intellectual, linking it to earlier comments, right, about where Black training happens, where Black educational circles and circuits occur. 
and how that is embedded in institutional structures and outside of it. Um, it was a, a such a, um, a, a wonder to um, be able to have a legal scholar who is um, one of the leading scholars of black feminist thought and um, intellectual production come together to rethink with us in front of us the ways in which larger audiences are being educated in the law. I had just never, I had never considered the way in which the press and legal education come together at this moment of such vital fertilization and conversation. Um, and to do so in ways that link us to the conventions is just um, a gift as your scholarship always is, Dr. Jones. So we want to thank you over and again for for um, being with us today um, and for all the work you, um, you offer and the graciousness, generosity, um, and fecundity with which, you, um, with which you do it. So thank you as a, as a, as a, as a daughter of Shad yourself, right? Um, thank you for um, um, bringing that in and being that um, with us today. We're gonna move um, now into thinking collectively about ways in which we can commemorate Mary Ann Shack Carey as we approach the 200th anniversary of her birth. Um, and we're going to move into um, the uh, thinking and planning um, for uh, what we ourselves might be interested in doing, classes we might teach, exhibits we might have, grants we might create um, uh, or, or apply for, um, collections we might digitize, um, uh, events that we might hold, um, how we can do that collectively in the spaces that we inhabit um, ourselves. So we're going to start, um, I want to see, let me actually, we're going to start by asking people to actually show yourselves and all going to gallery. If, if you have the time, if you would turn off your screen, since we're going to be thinking together, it might be a really good moment for us to be able to, to see each other. Thank you guys. We're going to get as close to the room as we can get, <laughs> you know, to being in a room together when we do that kind of strategic planning. Um, so many people who um, I've met and haven't met that um, we just really, really, um, it's great to see you guys. All right, we're going to start by doing just three minute snapshots of some of the planning that's already been done, not as a presentation, but as a way to start getting us to think through ideas that we might have. Not only ideas about new projects, but ideas about how we might expand on and um, extend the reach of projects that have already happened. There have been people doing this work for a long time. Um, not only Shad family that is in the room, right? But people who have been doing work in black historical societies. I think um, Lopez Matthews has told us um, has warned us, right, about the, the moment of um, what was called in some, you know, that kind of tokenism that can come with the anniversaries. So we want to honor the deep work that has already been done, but also think about the ways in which we can build on it collectively and regionally and individually in our own spaces um, as we get to 2023. Um, and so I'm going to move this to Arlene, who is standing in for Arlene Wilson and Curtis Small today. Um, some of the work that they did planning um, for exhibits at the Delaware Historical Society and the University of Delaware. Of course, Wilmington is one of the places that's just blocked the Delaware Historical Society from where the Shad family lived. Um, and then Sean Smith will talk a little bit about his work. And then Irene Moore Davis will talk about um, the work that is happening too in Ontario. So we're really interested in hearing about this. I'm going to ask you guys to do it quickly. Right, again, this is really a way for us to um, initiate ideas. Then all of us are gonna have a moment to talk a little bit about what we do very quickly into the room. Then we'll take a second to write a little bit about what we might do, how we might apply this to ourselves. Then we'll go into to small breakout rooms, maybe dyads in order to think through this with an audience, right? Like just a, a little bit of brainstorming together. Then we'll come back debrief, talk a little bit about next steps, and we'll go on from there. We expected this to be a small session, um, um, but we really wanted the thinkers and the doers of the word 
right, to, to get back to some early and important work, um, to be um, in, um, in the room together and have a chance to think collectively. So I'm gonna um, hand this over to Arlene um, where she can um, show just a couple of slides and in three minutes, I'll talk a little bit about the planning that Dig Black and the Center for Black Digital Research was really happy to sponsor with the Delaware Historical Society um, and uh, UD and the College of Arts and Sciences there. Okay, thank you, Dr. Foreman. I appreciate it. Hello, everyone. I'm Orlean. Um, I have been working on um, a Mary Ann Shad Carey exhibit with the Delaware Historical Society um, for the last three months or so. My colleague, um, uh, Kelly Barnes, is not here with us. What I want to do is just share my screen very quickly. I do have a couple of slide presentations or a couple of slides that I want to show because I think they're relevant. So um, Kelly and I, this is the first time we've actually put an exhibit together. And although she was a fellow at the um, Delaware Historical Society and I was working with Curtis Small at the University of Delaware, um, we had some resources that we started off with that made putting this project together um, um, much easier for us. So the one thing that we had, we ha I had worked on prior to this exhibit project, an archival finder, um, Gabrielle's out Arlene? of here. Yeah, it is. I'm so sorry. We can't see the slide. It may not that matter that much, but what we're seeing is a white screen. So you you may need to 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 stop sharing and then go back and choose what it is that you want to see. Sometimes it does that. Don't don't worry. Okay. Let me do this. I'm so sorry. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Okay. Yay. Thank sorry you. about that. <laughs> okay, I'll talk fast. So the reason why I want to show this is because Kelly and I really thought that we started off with resources that made our project, the, um, the exhibit work, so much easier for us. Prior to embarking on the exhibit project, I had worked on a spreadsheet with another colleague to create an archive finder. We searched through um, multiple repositories and databases to find any and all um, archival material on Mary Ann Shea Carey specifically and all of her family members and we put it in a spreadsheet. So before beginning this exhibit project, we had a pretty good idea of what material culture objects and letters um, and documentations and so forth were already out there so that when we put together what pieces we might want to request a loan from from these repositories, we had that at our fingertips. We also had a contact list of all Marianne Shad Carey known associates. So that also helped us in uh, deciding the type of narrative we could tell and that we wanted to tell. We also consorted with Brandy Locke, um, who had done a digital exhibit project through uh, the Color Convention Project on Marianne Shad Carey. And she was crucial in helping um, Kelly and I kind of figure out and parcel out the type of narrative and what story um, we wanted to tell. We also had points of contact with UD Library and the Delaware Historical Society. So we just basically took three quick steps. The first one, we immersed ourselves in the information. We read biographies. Um, I visited the Delaware um, University of Delaware Special Collections and Kelly, who is a, a historian PhD candidate, was working uh, the end at the Delaware Historical Society. We found and listed all the things that were related to Mary Ann Shed Carey. We looked for social, political, legal conditions for blacks in Delaware between the times, the dates that we knew that her family was in Delaware and Pennsylvania. Once we gathered this information, then we started to shape the narrative, taking into consideration what our colleague Brandy Locke um, had discussed with us. Um, we also met with local scholars, Syl Wilford and Lori Inglehart, and I, I really recommend that if you can find um, individuals within the society that are not necessarily academics that have been doing this work, that was crucial for us. We found a plethora more information and uh, material culture items that were out there that these scholars had actually found. Um, but then we considered the venue site. What we have, we're working with 19 cases. So we had to then visualize and visit that space and determine based on the space that we have, how much of the story could we tell? And then the third thing, we started to really build out concrete plans, outlining um, the exhibit in Google Slides, um, imagining the 19 cases when folks first walk up into that second floor to see the exhibit, what would they see first? Um, and then we started adding the documents that we were finding, listing physical items um, that we would pull from that archive finder to potentially ask for, um, for loans for. Um, and then we started to move towards budgets. Um, what were local archive designers in our area? How much did they charge? 
um, trying to figure out a loose budget of how much money we have to work with, whether or not we would be asking for grants. And then the project is still in the work. So we're continuing um, that work and also to fill in some of the archival material. Um, if I have a second, Dr. Foreman, if that's okay, I just wanna show very quickly this is the Google slide that we put together. So we have an exhibit outline. These are the major sections that we think that we're going to tell. Now, because the venue is in Delaware, it's the Delaware Historical Society, they really want the Delaware angle, obviously, for Marianne Shedd Carey. So Kelly and I were wondering that perhaps we might have a Canada exhibit running at the same time where they took her Canada years. Um, it, it would seem uh, uh, appropriate if we had, you know, some of the Canada, uh, some of the archives from Canada, her life in Canada, but we basically have Delaware, um, Pennsylvania, and then also DC. So that would be something that, um, in, ter in terms of making this a, a bigger project and collaborating um, with, uh, can, you know, Canadian repositories um, and, and perhaps even museums there would be, that would be willing to do an exhibit, that would be something to discuss. And that, um, okay, so I'm sorry, I'm gonna put it back to um, uh, Dr. Dr. Foreman here. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. There we Thank go. You Thank so, you so much, Arlene, for representing the team that did exhibit planning um, and for showing us a little bit about your process as you were doing that work as well. Um, I'm gonna to go to Irene Moore Davis and then we'll go to Sean Smith. Sound good? Absolutely. I mean, before I begin, I want to acknowledge fellow Shad descendant Dr. Bruce Purnell, who's in the room from the Washington, D.C. area. So we're really happy to have you. And I also want to acknowledge the amazing Leslie McCurdy. I trust that many of you already know her, but Leslie McCurdy is a fantastic Windsor, Ontario based actress who uh, regularly portrays Marianne Shad Carey as part of her one woman play, Things My Four Sisters Saw. So hopefully we'll have a chance to hear from Leslie uh, later on. Um, in terms of some, some things that are already going on on the Canadian side, um, the National Newspaper Association has recently uh, committed to offer a, uh, an annual award in the name of Marianne Shad Carey, and we're really excited about that. It's going to be based on uh, columnists. Um, because she had such an amazing editorial uh, uh, footprint. So um, I'm not sure when exactly that's being launched. It might be 2022 ahead of 2023, but that's exciting. That's sort of like Canada's equivalent of the Pulitzer. So we're really excited about that. Here in Windsor, you may have noticed my backdrop is uh, sort of a sculpture, a, a a bit of a detail of a sculpture. Our local uh, amazing artist, Donna Main, has created a bronze sculpture of Marianne Shad Carey, which is finished and it's in storage at the University of Windsor, awaiting a safe time for us to fully install and unveil that. So that would have actually happened yesterday, but our pandemic uh, situation here isn't so great. So that's been delayed to spring 2022. One of the things that's really exciting about that sculpture is that Museum Windsor here in Windsor is also interested in, um, now that there's been a delay, creating a, a small exhibit around um, that sculpture and in commemoration uh, of the 200th anniversary. So we're really excited to work with them on that. When I say we, I mean the Essex County Black Historical Research Society. So those are some of the things that are going on. I do want to mention as well, um, another sad descendant has been involved in a new children's book um, that's coming out through Scholastica regarding Marianne Shad Carey. Of course, we want to lift up and pay homage to the great children's book that Rosemary Sadler already wrote about, Rose, uh, about Marianne Shad Carey, Rosemary Sadler being the uh, former president of the Ontario Black History Society and, a, and quite a wonderful historian. So there's a new um, children's book for even younger readers um, coming out uh, regarding Marianne Shad Carey and that is expected in fall of 2022. So those are a few of the, of the jumping off points that could really result in some good things. Um, I know at the Essex County Black Historical Research Society, one of the things that we've kind of become specialists in is partnering on uh, curriculum projects that um, you know help to develop the resources that uh, schools and teachers need to properly convey and lead discussions about our history. So we've partnered with the Greater Essex County District School Board on another 
update to the uh, Roads to Freedom, African Canadian Roads to Freedom documents, which are resource documents for grades one through 10 that are used in our local English public school system. We recently just completed a project for a cross-border curriculum about the Underground Railroad with the University of Michigan. And we are um, putting in some grant uh, applications to come up with some specific curriculum resources that pertain to Marianne Shad Carey um, around the 200th anniversary. So we're really looking forward to having something that's ready to hit the ground running in that academic year and uh, give teachers a better opportunity to really explore the, the meaning and impact of this person who lived right here in Windsor and about whom too few Windsorites and Essex County residents still know. So that's it for me. I'm gonna turn it back to Gabrielle. Yeah, that's it. Just uh, just all of that. Um, <laughs> we wanna um, say ashe and hallelujah to all the work that is being done um, and, um, and particularly the children's book, the curriculum work, the sculpture. I mean, there's just such, um, I mean, of, of course it makes sense that um, so, so much um, harvesting and, um, and, um, and growing would be done um, in our mother's gardens where she planted herself, right? And, and her family and her descendants are as well. So um, uh, thank you very much for letting us know about that work. Uh, Sean, if you would um, go ahead and share a bit about what you guys are doing. Yes, and I have some slides, so I'll be happy to share those too. Um, yeah, so this is, um, we can go to the next slide, if you wouldn't mind. So yeah, essentially the question come, becomes why us, why the Archives of Ontario? And as we spoke about this morning, uh, we are one of the repositories that uh, has a significant amount of material related to uh, Marianne Chad Carey. Uh, right now it's all material on microfilm, but it, uh, we are going to be uh, receiving uh, uh, the uh, original material to preserve. And uh, in doing so, we have reached out to historical societies in Chatham, Buxton um, to just sort of uh, discuss the best place for those records and we, you know in, in the end to decide to, to come to us uh, and also as part of that we've committed to digitizing the entire collection and sharing it with the transcribe uh, shad project which is uh, super super exciting and then just following through on our commitment to ensure that this material uh, you know gets out to to the community that is widely used is 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 known to be available for use and incorporation into any projects that are, that are going on so we can go to the next slide so we met uh, at the Archives of Ontario. Uh, I'm a senior archivist, so I met with uh, some of my managers uh, just sort of to, to make sure that we were all on the, on, on the same page and that we were committed to working with this material going forward, understanding the, the importance of the 200th anniversary. Um, and just some ideas that came out of that and that we're looking forward to exploring. Um, obviously collaborating with other institutions locally and internationally, Arlene, for example, um, we have experience in uh, exhibits online and in person, um, and certainly with the experience of the pandemic, we're probably pivoting a lot more to online ex exhibits, but if that's something we can do in coordination with uh, institutions across the border uh, in other places in Canada to sort of really make sure that we're telling a multifaceted story, um, and then we're bringing sort of the, the, the role and the um, of Marianne Shad Carey within Ontario's story out to many people, then that's something we'll, we're, we're excited to look at. Um, we mentioned this morning the idea of just bringing all of the archival material together intellectually in one place so that uh, uh, an individual who's interested in exploring sort of the story of Marianne Shad Carey based on primary source material, they can go to one portal. They don't have to go to multiple portals or multiple places in order to see the material. Uh, certainly the idea of hosting uh, a speaker series of some kind um, that we can do virtually, that we can do in person, um, that gives us many opportunities to bring people together from uh, many different places to sort of reflect on the importance of the anniversary and, and the life of Marianne Shad Carey. Um, we're already revisiting and taking a look at our online exhibits related to Black histories in Ontario and certainly having the original material uh, from uh, the Robbins family will allow us to sort of work with the Ontario Black History Society and, and others in making sure that, that that material gets a prominent place within the, within those stories. 
Uh, outreach and promotion is something that we do, but certainly we will be reaching out to uh, all of the Ontario public service networks, all to all to all Shad Carey descendants, Black History Societies, and again, just making sure that uh, this isn't material that gathers dust, but it's mater material that, uh, that raises up and, and takes on life. Um, and then uh, I know that we, I talked about this, and we talked about this with Brooke, uh, with Lopez uh, some time ago, but let's see what kind of a practicum placement we can create. Not Maybe not necessarily for an archival student, but for somebody who can uh, have a meaningful experience interacting with this material firsthand. Uh, next, next slide. Um, I realize I repeated myself in one, one bullet here, so I apologize for that. But uh, of course, we'll commit to a uh, social media campaign to bring attention to the anniversary. But the, the one idea that uh, I'm kind of excited to, to look at uh, developing a bit more, um, over the course of the last year, I worked on a nomination of the Alvin D. McCurdy Fall, which is probably one of the most important collections of Black histories in Ontario. Um, and which uh, I assume Leslie McCurdy is familiar with, but uh, we we uh, it's it's quite a process to go through. But we worked with the Amherstburg Freedom Museum and the Ontario Black History Society in de in developing a nomination of that material to CC UNESCO's Canada Canada Memory of the World Register. Um, it elevates the collection. It obviously brings a lot of uh, focus to it. And from an institutional point of view, what that does is, is it means that we're committed to ensuring that that this material gets the attention it deserves over time. So uh, we'll be bringing in a practicum student in January to look at the descriptions of that material, see if we can tease out more information within it, looking at digitization opportunities. Um, so it would be really exciting to go through the same process with the Marianne Shad Carey material and look at, uh, at least for the CCU UNESCO uh, uh, side of things, to see if we could do that in conjunction with Library and Archives Canada. And if we could time it so that the announcement was made close to the anniversary, I think that would be super exciting. Um, the other one that we could look at as well is the UNESCO Memory of the World Register. Um, and I don't know enough about the process to speak about it confidently right now, but that is certainly something that we could look at across institutions uh, to see if, if, uh, if that's something we could do to elevate sort of this history to a worldwide audience. But uh, if, uh, if that would be possible, then it's something to look towards. And then my last slide is just a contact me slide, um, but uh, feel free to reach out if anybody has any questions or wants to follow up on any of these ideas. Um, if we don't exchange contact information in the breakout rooms, certainly feel free to reach out at any point in time, but uh, we're super excited to move towards uh, seeing what we can do. And if anybody's interested, this is a, a, an image uh, of uh, Fred Davis, who is uh, one of the first lawyers in, in, in Windsor, and it is from the Alvin B. McCurdy uh, fall. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, I'm going to uh, open this up actually for literally three minutes, three to four minutes for other people in the room who are doing important work on Marianne Shad Carey who would like to either put it into the chat um, or um, would um, like to put it into the room verbally. I'm gonna start by asking Nika Denny who is here if she has any announcements that she'd like to share. Yes, absolutely, thank you so much. Um, hi, folks. I am currently an assistant professor of history at Washington and Lee University, um, and I am working right now on a Shad Carey primary source reader uh, that is under contract with Oxford University Press, um, and we are planning to have it out before the 200-year anniversary. Um, so it will be at some point in 2023. Not sure if it'll be more like spring for Douglas Day um, or just later on in that year. Um, but at some point during 2023 is when the book will be released. Um, this is a collection that has work spanning 1848 to 1888, I believe, are the years that I'm looking at. Um, the chapters are examining Chad Carey's perspectives on racial uplift with an emphasis on labor, uh, women's rights, emigration. Um, and I also have a chapter called Contextualizing Chad Carey that has some, um, some commentary from her contemporaries. Um, so this is something I'm really excited about uh, that should be finished next month, assuming all goes well, um, and will be out um, in time for the anniversary. Let, let's all say I should have that. Um, that was a really nice sort of move over to Jim Casey, who can talk just for a second. He'll talk about it later. 
um, but maybe now is a good time to talk about Douglas Day. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Foreman. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Casey. I'm uh, one of the folks working on the team at the Center for Black Digital Research. Um, we are planning and, and overwhelmingly excited um, to work with everybody um, to put together with our team of folks here a crowdsourcing project that's going to let us bring all of the digitized materials together and then invite everyone to come and help transcribe those materials, create kind of information around them that will help expand the ways that we can get access to them. Um, of course, we know a stack of PDFs is great for those of us who really want to nerd out and get into them, but we want to make it easier for folks to be able to engage with those things. And so we're planning for 2023 to be able to feature that project, which we're calling sort of quote unquote transcribe shad um, at our annual Douglas Day holiday, which is an event we hold each Black History Month um, as a way of sort of inviting people to help not just sort of remember, but help to recreate um, Black history in a collective action kind of way. So we'd love to hear expressions of interest from folks who'd love to be a part of that team. Um, I think even if people don't volunteer, we might be tapping folks at various points to get your input, your thoughts, um, and expertise all around. So we're looking forward to sharing more as we go forward. Thank you, Jim. Brandy, can you talk just for a minute about the possibility of working with Mural Arts Philadelphia for a um, mural? Um, that Absolutely. Lord knows if it'll make it make it in time, but we hope. Yeah, I mean, we are we will be pushing, you know, our pedal to the our metal to the pedal pedal to the metal to make that happen because it would be so fantastic. Uh, we've already partnered with Mural Arts Philadelphia, um, which has literally transformed the landscape of Philadelphia in order to, um, you know, not only bring public art to the fore, but particularly. Uh, art that elevates Black histories. And so they've already, um, you know, decided they are fully on board with a mural that would be located in Wilmington, Delaware, featuring Marianne Chad Carey. Um, we, you know, always focus on Black uh, muralists and uh, the larger Black community surrounding the mural to engage in that project, because it's more than just putting something up. It's about engaging this history in our communities. Um, and, and figuring out how to create a sustained memorial to her. So um, we, you know, we invite feedback, folks who are interested, um, folks who uh, would love to be a part of that progress that involves programming, curriculum, you name it, we're, we're interested in doing that. So, yeah. I just wanna say that we're really in the preliminary um, stages of that. Um, what we're doing now is finishing a uh, color conventions um, mural in Philadelphia, and then we'll obviously be putting together an advisory committee um, that includes people in Delaware to choose the artist, to engage, to choose the wall, to, to be in conversation. So it's a long process that's really in its incipient stages um, and will um, that has not been quite announced publicly. So Connie, it hasn't quite been announced publicly, and we'll want to do that with people, with the appropriate police people, um, uh, to make sure that it's um, inclusive um, and um, that all the stakeholders are included. Um, so we're really looking forward to the possibility of that. Kristen, of course, is going to be editing a collection um, of the papers that come from this volume that we're hoping to have ready for 2023. Um, as well. Shirley, can you talk a little bit about digital editions um, and the possibility, um, uh, digital editions of Black Women's Organizing Archive um, as well? And then we'll go ahead and, and move to some um, to some reflection and, and into, into breakout rooms. Sure. Um, thank you. Yes. So the Black Women's Organizing Archive, um, for those who weren't here for the introduction yesterday, is kind of the newest project of the um, Center for Black Digital Research and really straddles um, and is, is kind of um, working across all of the different projects of the center, um, in particular carrying the uh, Color Conventions projects focus on um, recovering the work of Black women writers um, and bringing that out to, to broader publics. And so the um, Black Women's Organizing Archive is you, you heard Arlene talking a little bit about bringing together the scattered archives, and that's really the work of the Black Women's Organizing Archive, is to think about how can we bring together these scattered archives, um, and how can we work with different organizations and institutions to bring together um, the scattered archives of Black women writers. And so we're doing that work um, in conjunction with, with Douglas Day, and um, you know, you'll see transcribing the papers, but really starting to think through um, not only how we bring them together, how we work in community to transcribe them, 
Um, but what do kind of digital editions, digital exhibits, like what is that going to look like? What is the platform that brings all this work together? And so we're starting to think that through. We're really looking forward to being in conversation with many of the people here um, and thinking about projects that can support that, how we can do that in community, how we can do that in ways that continue to build pipelines for this scholarship and for um, future generations and, and um, communities to, to keep doing this work. Um, I wanted to ask Dr. Rudham to at least just like, she put a note that she's working on curriculum and an NEH grant, but if you would um, uh, just say hello to all of us um, and, um, and also for people to make sure that we share um, our contact information with Dr. Rudham and Dr. Rudham for you to do the same and back channels would be great so that we can share curriculum, but please say hello. Hello, everybody. I'm kind of late to the party, but it's just really great to be here. Thanks for organizing this. I'm really excited to collaborate. My colleague, Dr. Candace Logan Washington, um, is really the lead on Mary and Shay Carey. So I will definitely put both of our details in, and we're happy to collaborate with uh, Delaware folks, but also to travel possibly to Canada. So I'll be in touch. Thanks again. One of the things that um, we've been thinking, um, uh, Irene Moore Davis, is that since the sculpture got um, delayed, that maybe this provides us an opportunity to actually have more people head up right from this community, right from the symposium to really celebrate um, that sculpture, um, you know, as she crossed boundaries, maybe we can cross boundaries too to celebrate um, the work that is being done there um, as, as well. Um, so as, as uh, Dr. Rudham said, right, you know, like maybe we can get to Canada, that would be really lovely. I know that um, the folks who have been doing performance work under Lynette um, Overby have, has, have also been really eager to, to be involved in that. I don't know if folks caught that there was a lot of um, performance work that we did before the perform before this symposium. We had a whole year um, of workshops and performances of Canadian artists um, and dancers and poets and US dancers and artists and poets that was really quite incredible. So please um, head to um, uh, Ditch Black um, so website in order to look at some of those which are all available online as well. We're going to move to thinking and um, and um, together collectively, but we're also going to turn off the recording so we can kind of really think together. And so I am charged to say thank you to everybody um, who um, um, who has um, come through today as part of the audience, as the presenters. We'd like to thank our funders. Um, and um, and all of um, the audience members and collective thinkers who have done work, who have not made it to the room, who have been available in our Twitter audience, et cetera. Um, and we just want to say thanks uh, to, to uh, again, to, to the Delaware Humanities, um, to Queens University, um, to um, the College of Arts and Sciences. I'm getting all kinds of um, little notes that are slightly distracting um, that are going off um, on, um, but we, we, we really do want to, to express our appreciation to the, uh, the team that is doing the work behind the scenes as well. Um. Something is moving